Okay, so hello, good morning, good afternoon, or hello everyone. So welcome to Neurotech X, XR Biosense 2022. So feel, feel free to, to say hello in the chat on, on just a wrap up uh, where are you based from, which city or uh, maybe which Neurotech X uh, chapter. And I will uh, take a few minutes just to introduce a bit the event for the new uh, people who are joining us for this second day. Um, and then I will uh, let the floor to our uh, panelists. So uh, I will just, um, so just to introduce you uh, uh, Neurotechix. So Neurotechix is in an international networks uh, from it's a, it's a community a community based originally in uh, in Canada in Montreal and created by uh, Yannick Roy and uh, we have three main uh, pillar or code of conduct so we have like uh, try to promote uh, the community as a connector with uh, uh, various uh, people from uh, PhD students entrepreneur enthusiasts around neurotechics on raw technology in general. Uh, we have a strong uh, pillar related to education with a, a, a platform called Neurotechix EDU. Uh, we have a, a student club, student club competition, some books on, on other resources to help you to, uh, as a beginner or expert, to, to discover the field of neurotechnologies. And we also have a, um, a big expertise uh, for the people who are interested more in the um, entrepreneur and marketing and, and innovation in general with a, a, a service called Neurotechic Services to help uh, people and organizations who need uh, some, some advice for that. Uh, so we, have, we are no... Uh, uh, almost all, all around the world with a, what we call chapter. So chapter, it's related to a community on, on a city in general. So we have uh, more than uh, 30 uh, chapters now no, with uh, some connect, connect them. So we have like uh, kind of a hierarchy with, uh, for example, in Europe on LATAM region to, to help people to connect and to start new chapter on new, new local communities. And we are all uh, connected together on a Slack, and we also have a, a Discord, if you will. Uh, so these links are available on the Neurotechix website. We have a lot of events and initiatives, uh, such as Neurotechix Gaming, uh, a challenge around epilepsy with a data set. We host uh, the Buzz Interview, and uh, we have Student Club Competition, and we also have like local, specific local event or or gathering like uh, the ACNAC session, uh, what happen as a weekly basis uh, with Paris and San Francisco. Uh, just a, a few, uh, uh, a short zoom on, on the buzzing review. So it's uh, the third year we, we try to like wrap up the, the, the news uh, and we try to cover the research, the tech industry, the funding areas, the regulatory update and, and so on to our local community with um, a curation of uh, neurotechics. Um, so it, it happened a few weeks ago now. And we have also other initiatives like uh, a content lab with a medium pages, uh, a book who is available um, on Amazon since a few months called the Neurotech Primer. We also have like a special uh, Neurotech design series hosted by uh, Neurotech X Barcelona chapter and so on and so on. And uh, yeah, we have no more like six or seven years. Uh, so Neurotech X uh, start in uh, 2050. And about the XR Biosense event, so the, the goal and the momentum of this event is to try to uh, explore and, and we, we see a lot of discussion between uh, the neurotechix interest in the immersive technologies, so uh, augmented reality, virtual reality and all the technology in between. 
and we have a lot of questions, a lot of experiment was running out uh, in, in the lab, in the, in the different community, in, uh, with the DIY approach. And, and uh, we have also more robust project on very like big project like the Galias project from OpenBCI. And we see that and as an opportunity as neurotechics to try to decipher and try to uh, and help to understand, to promote uh, some initiative on, on this field. So we, we have a lot of tendency, a new hardware, new software, and a lot of evolution around that. Also a big um, awareness about the privacy, the ethical issue we can, we can have around that. Uh, so we try to, to explore all of that in, in this uh, uh, new initiative. And so we call it XR Biosense. Um, and uh, we tried also to promote community projects. Today, we have people who uh, uh, try to popularize neural technology and uh, immersive technologies and uh, uh, signal processing and so on. Uh, we have open source project related. Uh, and and uh, yesterday, you also have artists to work in, uh, in this. Uh, uh, we try to explore this area. Uh, I would like also to thank the team uh, behind me to, to help to, to wrap up this new event. Uh, so we have a, a team with uh, uh, people from all around the world uh, on administrator of Neurotech X. And uh, just to also wrap up about the event. So yesterday we host a, a keynote or a table on the French panel and today. So we have three tech conferences. And just after that, we have a, what we call a Neurobar. So it's a space for everyone to, to speak with, with each other and to, to ask questions to also to, to, to our experts. And uh, we'll try to continue this, this new initiative on, on this effort and try to create uh, some working groups, some performances with uh, some demos and so on, and try new materials. And I also would like to uh, thank you, uh, all our panelists from yesterday and today. Um, so uh, that's um, a very nice panel for this first uh, initiative. Uh, so that's uh, the visual of the, the whole programmation from these two days. So I, I think you are a bit familiar with it. And uh, just to go to the... Um, so I just finished my introduction. And now I will type you... Um, thank you again, uh, the Neurotech guys, Pierre, Sylvain, and Martin, to do join us today. And I just... Uh, give you the floor uh, to uh, to Colin and Harrison to to start their their technical lecture. So the floor is up to you. Thank Wonderful. you so much. You. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen in a second here, but just while that is uh, getting pulled up, I'm, I'm gonna have to pull the screen share from you. But while that is getting Pulled up again, I just want to say thank you very much for having us. Um, we're excited to talk to all of you, and this is going to be um, just a brief technical overview. So some pretty basic neurotech information, but just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and has a little bit of a primer um, before you start getting into some of the other talks. But I think this is a really cool event. Um, I love the focus on XR and integrating neurotech and brain computer interfacing. So happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so as, as was said, we are the BCI guys. Uh, we are content creators on uh, YouTube. Once again, thank you for having us. Um, we create educational uh, content and hopefully entertaining content uh, with sort of the goal to uh, push the neurotech field more into the mainstream, uh, meaning you know, getting this content out there in an engaging uh, and interesting way. Um, so that the everyday person starts to become more interested in neurotechnology uh, and sort of overlaps with their existing interests. Um, a little bit about me uh, and Harrison. We actually founded a uh, research group at our alma mater, uh, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, specifically around neurotechnology. Um, we went to a bunch of different maker fairs. Uh, we went to Dubai and presented some of our um, work that we used um, OpenPCI's boards for, as well as uh, we used MyOware boards, I believe, at the time. 
as well as our own amplifiers. Um, so that was a great time. That's how Harrison and I met in uh, at, at school in 2018. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I am a former employee, well, intern uh, at OpenVCI. Um, I worked there for about a year. Uh, I've also sponsored hackathons for them. Um, I uh, grew interested in brain computer interfacing in 2019, or sorry, sorry, 2014. Now I think about it, uh, when a friend of mine was diagnosed with uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, um, and uh, that sort of sparked this initial interest um, into the field and you know creating devices for people uh, who are in locked-in states. And I'm I'm Harrison. Um, I've been interested in neurotechnology for about 10 years. Um, in high school, I was just kind of teaching myself whatever I could um, and then came into college in a neurotechnology program. Um, so it's a build your own major where I'm merging neuroscience, business and design. Um, and then, as Colin mentioned, in 2018, we started that research group together. And now we're working on um, the BCI guys. And really, the, the goal that kind of ties all of that together is just bringing more people into the space. Because, I mean, one, we love this technology and want it to grow. And one of the best ways to do that is bring more people into it. But also, um, you know, just to bring people in, we also feel like there's an ethical imperative as well to start um, expanding the scope of, of what people are, what people know about neurotech. So I mentioned that we do the BCI guy stuff. So we primarily make videos that we do um, stuff on other social media platforms as well. But over on the left, we did some reporting on some research that came out. Uh, this was from University of California, San Francisco. Um, and then this one was from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. These were both uh, ways to, uh, they were speech brain computer interfaces. And then recently we did, we use a P300 speller um, from GTAC to play some video games. Um, and we also produced a full course, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end, if people are interested in getting uh, some more foundational knowledge about neurotechnology and brain computer interfacing. So what is neurotechnology? I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this term, but just to go over this quickly, it's technology that records, stimulates, or works with the brain. That last part is like um, a brain computer interface or the nervous system. Um, and there are a lot of different functions from medical applications to expanding beyond that into maybe gaming or these other XR technologies that neurotech uh, can move into. This is more of a technical definition, but I really like this second uh, definition that we added onto it, which is the future of human computer interaction, because I think especially um, in this set of talks, it's really exciting to think about where this technology can go and what, how that changes what it means to be human and, and all of these questions I think are really exciting. So we can break neurotechnology down into, we've broken it down into four main categories. Um, although there are lots of subdivisions that you can make. So this first one is neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is using um, electrical or magnetic or other means of, of stimulating um, neurons so that you can either have more regions become more active or inhibit those regions for medicinal purposes. Um, we have neuroimaging, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware of. So that's your uh, MRI machines, PET scans, MEG. Um, this is for clinical purposes mostly or research purposes. Um, neurofeedback and neuromarketing, um, this could kind of fall in brain computer interfacing as well, but we separate this because neuromarketing is looking at brain activity to assess how, pe how people are interested in engaging with products or ads. Um, and so you look at like fMRI data in this example to see how people are reacting. And then neurofeedback we separated because this is, so a computer is reacting to your brain state, but really to try to get you um, to change that brain state, maybe to relax or help with pain management. Um, so it's sort of trying to modulate your own brain activity and just measuring and changing based off of that. And then finally, we have brain computer interfacing, um, which in my opinion is the most exciting, but this is using brain signals to actively control external devices. So both of the examples here, we have uh, speech or communication neuroprosthetic devices. The one on the left um, is imagined handwriting. And then on the right, um, moving a cursor around to type on an Android tablet. Um, so just to give a brief overview um, of how we classify some of these technologies, one of the simplest ways is just where it is. 
So we have invasive neurotechnologies, which have to be penetrating brain tissue. So it can either be up on the top or have an electrode that goes deeper into the brain. You have semi-invasive, like the electrocorticography array, which sits on top of the brain, but does not penetrate brain tissue. And then you have non-invasive technologies like EEG, which sits outside of the skull. Now it's important to mention, these are all technologies that record electrical signals, electrophysiological um, neurotechnologies. But as we mentioned before, there are lots of other ones that can also be classified as invasive or non-invasive that may use different methods to collect brain signals. So when we're, one of the things that we're going to go into here is kind of the building blocks of how you actually work with and, um, and create these devices. And so the three steps that we can always boil it down to is the collection of data. And so this is talking about what type of device um, we're actually going to use and how we're picking up those signals the encoding of that data. So there's a lot of filtering that has to be done with these signals and then machine learning or whatever, or statistical analysis, whatever your process is to actually make that useful. And then to the, the deployment of that, um, of what we're getting from that data so that you can actually control something. Um, so we wanna just give you some very, very basic um, foundational neuroscience knowledge. Um, so this is a brain, I'm sure everybody can identify that. Um, and just to split this into three major segments, we have uh, the brainstem at the bottom, which carries out a lot of your essential life tasks like breathing and heart rate, sleep modulation, attention, stuff like that. Uh, the cerebellum at the back, which is Latin for little brain, and you can kind of see why it does look like a little brain at the, at the back there. Um, and this is mostly really important for uh, fine motor control. So the cerebellum is the difference between me touching my nose and knowing where it is in space and me slapping myself in the face. Um, so it helps with that coordination. It may also be involved in emotion and language processing. Then the cerebrum is really this, this large area up here that does a lot of the things that I think we associate with what a brain does, our higher cognitive functioning, our sensory input, learning and memory, all of that happens up there. And then, of course, um, in brain computer interfacing, we mostly focus on this top layer of the brain, which is actually only a few millimeters called the cortex, which is Latin for bark. So it's kind of that outside layer. Um, and this is where the cell bodies of the neurons, where those processing actually happen up in the cortex. And then they send their signals um, more towards the center of the brain to connect with other areas. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but it's just important to note that the brain can be divided up into many subsections. And this is kind of a, a gross overall look at those subsections, but you can further divide. Um, and this is really important for people to know if you're working with brain computer interfacing, because obviously if you want to use a motor neuroprosthetic, if you want to control something with motion, you should be looking for signals that come from the areas that control your body, that control motor movements in your body. Um, and, you know, there's a uh, constant back and forth between how localized are functions to a given area and how distributed are there. And it's pretty clear now that it is definitely a combination of both where you have areas that specialize, but the brain is constantly talking to itself, providing back feedback. Um, so modulating itself in all different areas, which is kind of interesting because it's actually affecting our perception as we go through that. So some areas down the chain um, that help us classify information can actually modulate activity that's coming in right through the visual areas and change what we're seeing in those very early areas. Um, so those are all just important things to, to be aware of. Um, and then we have, of course, um, the functional cell that allows us to think that um, is the one that's actually transmitting electricity through our brain, which of course is the neuron, which can be broken down into three parts. So over on the left, we've got the dendrites, which are receiving information. So there are lots of these branching structures that come out of the cell and they connect with other neurons and take in those signals. And then there's also the soma. And so both of these are involved in processing of determining, do I want to fire? Do I want to, that is to say, do I want to send a signal to another neuron or do I want to um, not fire. And then this axon here can be thought of as a wire. Um, so this can reach out quite long. Um, in the human body, it can reach a little bit over a meter, the long ones. So those are really big cells. And in whales and blue whales, they can reach above 30 meters, which is really crazy if you're thinking about one cell. But this is, can be thought of as a wire that then connects to the dendrites later down the line. So when a neuron fires, we call that an action potential. So when it's transmitting a signal, we call that an action potential. And these are all, in a, all or nothing events. So while there's processing, the soma and the dendrites, once it reaches the axon, it's as soon as it starts, it is definitely going and it can't be stopped um, unless uh, artificially stopped. 
And so if we were to take an electrode and measure the electrical potential at any given point um, on that axon when it's firing, this is, the, this is the graph that we would see. And just to break this down very, very briefly, um, we have some important, uh, important points to go over here. So a neuron is usually holding its, um, a neuron is usually holding its membrane potential, um, so the voltage across the potential, at negative 65 millivolts. Um, and so that zero point is set at if all of the, if all of the ions were um, at zero and happy, then that's where that would be. So this is actually creating a lot of potential energy in there because the, the ions want to neutralize to zero. Once it reaches this threshold, once it's stimulated by other neurons, then it's definitely going to fire. It goes all the way up here and then recovers, uh, dips down a little bit, and then gets back to that resting potential. But again, this is just what it looks like um, electrophysiolog uh, physiologically if you uh, put an electrode at a given point. And it's important to note, I said before, that this is a chain reaction, um, that this waveform that we saw is actually moving down as that potential moves down the, moves down the axon, and you have a... Um, an electrochemical uh, interaction that's happening here that allows this to, to go forward. And it's really, really cool if you're interested in like electrical engineering, I recommend looking into this. Um, and this can, in the human body, travel at max uh, 256 miles per hour. Um, one more thing that's important to mention is that that uh, action potential curve that we saw doesn't actually change, that remains the same. So if you have more and more current injected it, it doesn't actually change that graph. However, it, changed the amount, it changes the amount of times that the neuron fires. So we see this injected current here. When this square wave is small, it doesn't uh, create an action potential. But once it's in the middle, it does. And then the larger that is, we see more spiking. So that's how we measure how active a, a neuron is. Um, and then finally, uh, to wrap up our neurophysiology, Neurons are, most neurons in the, in the human body and the ones that are at least doing processing are not actually connected. So you have a space, a pardon for the train in the background, but you have a space in between the two neurons coming together. Um, and you actually have uh, these chemicals called neurotransmitters, which everyone has probably heard of. That's your dopamine, serotonin, um, that end up transversing this cleft. And then they merge onto receptors on the other side that open, allow ions in to start that chain reaction again. So now we're going to get into uh, some of the different types of non-invasive neurotechnologies uh, that sort of exist right now and the, the ones that are most commonly used uh, in the industry. First and foremost is electroencephalography, which is uh, the most common brain computer interface available, at least as hacker projects and as consumer projects. Uh, right now. Um, most common uh, brain computer interface, obviously very cheap to make and manufacture. Um, it also struggles with spatial resolution, however. Uh, and that's because with electroencephalography, essentially what you're doing is you're placing electrodes on, on top of the skull to pick up the action potentials of neurons firing in the brain. Um, now, obviously, that electrode has to read through all these different biological layers within the skull uh, in order to receive the signal. Um, so that can interfere with some of the spatial resolution of electroencephalography. But on the flip side of that, very high temporal resolution, meaning that it, it gets real-time data very quickly and is able to act very quickly on that data uh, in comparison to most neuroimaging techniques that are used uh, in research and in the medical field right now. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can sort of see what electroencephalograph looks like. Um, this is uh, an EEG from OpenBCI's GUI. Uh, as you can see, you can see the time series on the left. So that's like the raw brainwave data. Uh, you can see the FFT plot, which is bringing that, um, that time series data into the frequency domain and then displaying that. Uh, so you can see you know, which frequency certain brainwaves are, are, are firing at. Um, and then the bottom right is the head plot. So that's just a simple visualizer that uh, shows where, you know, which electrode is being activated on the brain. Um, similar to EEG is electromyography, similar in that it's using the same underlying technology, basically. Um, you know, it's still reading these action potentials firing, uh, but instead of reading them firing from the brain, the cortical surface, it's reading uh, from the actual uh, nerves in your muscles. Um, and my headset is obviously dying, which is the worst time for this to happen, right? So one second. 
while he's doing that, I'll, uh, oh, are you good? Sorry Con? about that. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Worst time for it to, to beep at me. Um, anyway, uh, so electromyography is a very obvious, large uh, signal, very, very loud signal that comes off of muscles, because obviously when you fire a muscle, uh, a lot of electricity is, is emitted from that event. Um, so, and it's also very easy to detect because, you know, activating skeletal muscles is a very voluntary movement. Um, so it's very easy to, to interpret that as, you know, we're just watching this muscle and seeing if that muscle is going to, going to activate and then, you know, doing some, some event based on that. Um, in the next slide, we, we can see, uh, me utilizing, uh, electromyography from my jaw, uh, to move a robotic arm. Um, so the, the basic idea here is that the higher the amplitude of that electromyography signal that's coming off my jaw muscle, uh, the, the further down the, the hand closes. Uh, and these are just like, this is just a very simple use case for electromyography. Next, we have uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy, uh, which is sort of um, a whole new type of recording um, signals in, compared to the last two. Um, what this does is this utilizes um, infrared light to essentially go into the, to the brain, uh, pass through biological layers, and then uh, determine whether or not an area of the brain is being activated uh, by picking up the hemoglobin of the brain uh, or of the blood, sorry, in the brain and those specific areas. Um, so it's a little bit different from EEG or EMG in that it's not actually reading the electrical signals coming off of the brain, but actually looking at the, uh, the blood flow in certain areas of the brain. Uh, to determine whether or not they're activated. And then we have magnetoencephalography, which is um, once again, similar to, um, to EEG, but rather than using electrical signals, we're actually collecting magnetic signals. Um, so the biggest benefit of magnetoencephalography is you have that high temporal resolution uh, from the electroencephalography, similar to that, uh, but you also have a high spatial resolution because the magnetic fields don't actually die down with distance at all. So they're not interrupted by the biological layers um, that have held electroencephalography back. Um, one of the downsides though of magnetoencephalography is it's very expensive uh, and you basically have to do it in a uh, shielded room, magnetically shielded room. So basically a, bar a Faraday cage uh, around uh, this magnetic uh, encephalography device. Um, so it's, it's, it's helpful, and I think that in the future, it's going to be one of the standout technologies, um, but for now, you know, it's really only used in research uh, and for medical purposes. All right, so we've talked about some of the devices that are out there, and, and now I want to talk about some methods of how you can actually use them for your projects or how scientists are using them right now to create a brain-computer interface. Um, and so we're going to focus mostly on EEG, although a lot of these can be applied to some of the other technologies that Colin spoke about as well. Um, but we're focusing on EEG because that's the easiest, that's the most accessible um, and one of the easier ones to, to work with. Um, so we've broken how you use uh, brain computer interfaces down into two groups, asynchronous BCIs and synchronous BCIs. Um, and so we'll start with the asynchronous ones. So asynchronous BCIs are generally voluntary. So these are actions where you are planning that you want to do something. So maybe you want to move a cursor up on a screen. Um, that is something that's voluntary. So you're trying to do that and then it responds from that. Um, but one interesting thing that we run into is that depending on the study and the population, there is about a 15 to 30% brain computer interface illiteracy rate with asynchronous BCIs. Um, which is really interesting. And so that just means that there is 15 to 30% of the population, regardless of intelligence or other metrics, that just for whatever reason can't use these devices um, through training. And, um, and that's just really interesting and a, and a challenge that we've yet to figure out why. Um, so these are also self-paced because they're, because they're voluntary. Um, so you choose when you want to do an action and they are not tied to an external stimulus. Again, meaning you get to choose when it happens um, and you modulate your own brain activity. So one of the ways that we can do this is through motor imagery. So this is imagined movement. Um, maybe I imagine my hand going up, down, or to the left or to the right, and then you can use that to control a cursor on a screen. That's an example of that. And so you measure from the motor and premotor areas of your brain uh, to pick up these signals. And then using some machine learning, you might be able to figure out what direction the person is, the person is thinking of as long as you've gone through some training. 
Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is called population coding. So at this point, this is pretty much uh, only reserved for invasive neurotechnology, but it's really important for a lot of the research that's coming out. So I wanted to, and that has been coming out for a while in uh, neuroprosthetics. So I wanted to bring this up, but basically how this works is in the motor cortex and even in sensory areas as well, but focusing on the motor cortex, there are neurons that prefer different directions because it's actually not our brain that is sending uh, signals to individual muscles, but it sends signals to the spinal cord and says, I wanna move my arm or my hand or my finger in this direction. And that spinal cord is actually what recruits the individual muscles. So if we think of this in terms of directionality and in terms of moving in a direction, we see that there are neurons that prefer a specific direction. Um, and so these have sort of been mapped around here. And when the monkey wants to move his arm over to the left to 180 degrees, we see that there are neurons that get really excited by this. So all of these little black lines, which are a little bit blurry, each one of these black lines represents uh, a neuron firing, one of the neurons they were measuring from firing. And we see the ones that are associated with uh, this leftward movement get really excited. And then we see a big gap in activity um, over on the right for these uh, these neurons that are in the opposite direction. Um, and then basically through uh, adding vectors together, that's how the brain kind of determines what direction we're going in. And neuroscientists can actually pick that up and run calculations based on just what those neurons are outputting to figure out the vector. Um, here's just a very simple animation showing that. So we see that there are these little lines are spikes. Um, so every neuron that's firing and the vectors add up to the center direction. So now let's talk about synchronous BCI. So these are not um, under direct conscious control, um, although you can have some influence over them. And so we're, we're really measuring responses, whether that's to cognitive events or sensory events that produce these repeatable waveforms that you can pick up in the brain. So um, one example is focus modulation. I put this one first because we actually do have some level of control over this. Um, so this was just a little game where if you focus, you use the force, um, you can make this X-wing um, move up and down based off of that. And so the underlying physiological state is considered synchronous, but you can actually learn how to modulate and change your brain activity based on focusing. Um, and how we do this is under an important concept um, of classifying brain waves. So these are kind of just lines that neuroscientists have drawn to help understand brain state um, in a very simplistic way. And so there are five ways that are generally recognized to classify these. We have the delta waves at the bottom, which are these big swoops that go from uh, 0.5 to 4 hertz, so four of these waveforms per second. Um, and that's associated with deep sleep. And then moving up gets um, more to heightened, awake, uh, heightened awakeness and, um, and focus. So we've got meditation and, and some creativity coming in the theta area, usually some sleep as well. Um, alpha waves, you're relaxed. And then beta and gamma, again, you've got that heightened awareness, problem solving. And so we can use that in different devices to make a focus widget that you can control a drone, for example. Um, we also have, this is a really important concept, we have event-related potentials, or ERPs, and so these are re uh, repeatable brainwave responses that you see in the brain that occur after some sort of a stimulus, um, and so there, these can be classified into two types, so we have the sensory ERPs, which respond to sensation, so imagine like your finger is touched, the the somatosensory cortex, which uh, interprets those signals, is going to have this fairly repeatable waveform um, that you see that comes uh, right after the stimulus. Um, and you also have cognitive ERPs, which are associated with cognitive events, like maybe decision making based on something or deciding to do a task or not to do a task, uh, a no-go or a go task. Um, and so you can measure those to, to understand different things. Um, and so this is kind of what the traditional ERP waveform looks like. So we have negative deflections um, and positive deflections. I realized that it looks flipped on the graph, but this is how it's written a lot of times. And you can measure the amplitude, um, the height of each of these peaks, as well as their temporal relationship where they come after stimulus to gleam certain information about, uh, about what the person is doing. And up here, you can see that this waveform has been broken apart into, um, into areas of interest, which as I will go into, can be used for different things. 
So the first one is the P300 response. So if we go back and look here, that's occurring. It's a positive deflection. So it's down over here. That occurs about 300 milliseconds after the stimulus is presented. Um, and so this is something that can be used as an example for a keyboard. Um, so how this works is imagine that you're looking at the letter J, you want to type the letter J. Every time that letter flashes, um, regardless of whether it's from a horizontal line or a vertical line, um, your brain gets excited and then the computer can kind of pick up that heightened P300 response and determine where they overlap to select that letter. Um, this is another example of a P300 application where maybe you wanted to drive a little car. Um, you have these flashing, uh, flashing lights, and when yours lights up, then it selects, uh, it selects that direction. Again, just a little infographic to show that when you're looking at a letter that's not lit up, lit up so it looks like this person is focused on the O, um, you just have uh, fairly standard oscillatory brain waves once it's filtered out. And then here we see this large peak when that lights up. And so the computer can look at that uh, temporal relationship, go back 300 milliseconds and say, oh, this was the letter that was on the screen. Um, two more to focus on that are just kind of interesting. So we have this N100 ERP. So that's occurring right here about 100 milliseconds after, um, after stimulus presentation. And this uh, is associated with, so larger, larger amplitude in this is associated with um, surprise. So a sudden noise or a flash of light, something that might jolt you, um, you can see a big effect on the N100 response. And then finally, we have the N400 response, which I think is really interesting because it shows some early processing, which occurs when something doesn't make sense. Humans are pattern seeking animals. And so if we see that pattern break, um, there, there's a larger response to the N400 area, which can gleam some insight into what our brain is doing. So an example, if I read the sentence, I take coffee with cream and dog, everyone listening to that just had an N400 response in their brain because dog does not make sense in that sentence. So it's a little bit confusing. Uh, we also have visually evoked potentials, which in practice is kind of similar to using the P300 response. Um, and so what this is doing is if you take uh, a recording from the back of the brain and the back of the brain are the early areas in visual processing, you can actually see um, a frequency. You can pick up the frequency that the person is looking at. So if you have different objects on a screen flashing at different rates, you can see that pickup um, on the back of their brain and know what what thing they're looking at um, just from reading that signal. So as an example, here's a little animation that I made. Um, if you focus, let's say that you're looking over at nine hertz, the nine hertz and six hertz arrows are flashing at different rates. And so the computer will be able to tell by looking at your brain waves what direction um, you want it to go just by reading six hertz or nine hertz um, in the back of the brain. Yeah. Um, so once you have all this raw data, though, coming in from a brain computer interface, obviously it can be sort of a, um, a monumental task to even begin, you know, sorting through that data, trying to figure out what you're going to be doing with that data. Um, and uh, when we're talking about process and filtering here, uh, I just want to uh, preface this by saying this is primarily with uh, electroencephalo uh, electroencephalographs. Um, so that's the action potentials firing, the, the uh, actual... Um, the actual raw data coming from an EEG device. Um, so first and foremost, we have notch filters. Notch filters will remove um, any power line art artifacts or basically any artifact that is going at a certain frequency. Um, but generally, it's used for power line artifacts. Um, notch filters are super helpful. Um, they, they get out the, like I said, like if you're plugged into a wall and the power line suddenly surges or whatever, you can see that just a huge uh, like increase in, in a certain frequency on your data and that can mess everything up. Um, so it's, not, it's nice to throw that in there. And if you're in the UK, typically that's 50 Hertz, I believe for, for their notch filters. Uh, and in the US it's 60 Hertz for us. Um, that's just what the power lines run at. Uh, then there's bandpass filters. Bandpass filters will actually select like a certain uh, area of frequency uh, ranges that you want. So like you could select like five Hertz to like 30 Hertz, uh, for example. Uh, and that just allows for those specific frequency bands to exist in the, the data that you've filtered. Uh, this is helpful for removing, removing noise from like uh, EMG. So EMG is typically very high frequency, right? And it comes in very loud signal. So this is good to get rid of that e those EMG artifacts as well as heartbeats, which are common artifacts in electroencephalography uh, data gathering. 
Uh, and then obviously we have post-processing. Uh, moving, moving averages are the easiest way to do this. You just set a filter or a, a, a variable that changes based on all of the averages coming in from the data as the um, machine is running, obviously. Um, and then post-processing. So m machine learning specifically, we're gonna talk about here in the next slide. So machine learning um, works by essentially having a subject do, this, this is a very bare bones explanation of how machine learning works in uh, brain computer interfacing applications, um, just for the record. <laughs> um, but the, the basic idea is to ask the subject to do uh, a few very specific tasks. So you might ask the subject to imagine moving their right arm up like that, right? Um, then you basically look at that data try to sync it up to that time when that person moved their arm up uh, and then bin it. So you, you basically select that feature, right? Uh, and create a, a signature for that data. Uh, and then what should happen um, on a well-designed machine learning interface um, is it, it will then accept raw data as it comes in from the brain computer interface and basically look for signatures that are very similar to that bin that you selected in the the, uh, the previous round, right? So the idea being, can you detect when somebody is thinking, you know, move their arm up like this? Um, so uh, there's a lot obviously more to it than that. Uh, we didn't wanna go too in depth into the machine learning aspect of this for this uh, slide or for this, for this presentation, um, but there's a lot of uh, really interesting strides that have been made specifically in the data analysis and machine learning parts of brain computer interfacing, especially in the last five years or so. And fi finally, um, one of the most important parts of uh, brain computer interfacing is knowing how to work both in the time domain and in the frequency domain. This is probably the best GIF that exists of what a fast Fourier transformation looks like. Um, but, and this is just taken right, right from Wikipedia. Uh, the top here being the, the, the time domain. So this is the time domain that it's showing right here. Um, and we'll see that you can actually take uh, the time domain and we'll just watch it here together. And it'll actually go into the frequency domain here if you apply this, this uh, fast Fourier transformation. So there you can see the different frequencies more clearly. You can see the amplitudes of the frequencies more clearly. Um, and you can overlay multiple channels by using this as well. So you can see like, uh, like maybe you have channel one, channel two, channel three, et cetera. Uh, and then obviously you can overlay them across each other. Yeah, and so um, just, just to mention, uh, what it's what it's doing there um, is it's pulling apart all of the sine waves so you can see those individual sine waves and one area where that might be useful is if you have an artifact like a blink for example you're gonna get this big spike from that from that muscle activity um, and what you can do is when you separate these sine waves apart you can just get rid of some of those larger ones and then focus in on the smaller ones so you don't actually lose that brain data that occurs when that happens um so let's talk about some of the uh common used applications for brain computer interfaces in industry right now. This is a P300 keyboard. Um, so the idea of this is, uh, or is this, this might be SSVEP Harrison, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, this, this is SSVEP. So if you, it's kind of tough to tell in the GIF because it's a low frame rate, but what this user is doing is looking at individual letters, which are gonna be flashing at different frequencies. And again, um, based on what we talked about before, that frequency can be picked up and you can actually type pretty quickly with these. So this is, this is a great option um, mm. as long as you're not prone to epilepsy. Um, and we should mention, I know there's been a little bit of flashing before, so um, I apologize for not having a warning before then, but there will continue to be flashing in some of these GIFs. So and, if you're and, sensitive to that, just, yeah, And once ahead. again, uh, SSVEP is steady state visually evoked potentials. So that mm -hmm. the idea being that each of these different letters is flashing at a different frequency, right? So maybe the top left is, is flashing at six Hertz and the bottom right is at nine Hertz and they're sort of randomized in between there. Um, and it's basically just observing the occipital cortex back here, the occipital lobe, sorry. Uh, and that's emitting the, the essentially the frequency of, um, of whatever you're looking at. So if you're looking at something that's flashing at six Hertz and emits six Hertz. Um, next, we have a great example of using electromyography uh, in industry. This is, I think this is one of the prototypes for the N-Move. I could be wrong about that. Or control um, labs. The control labs, yes, thank you. Yep. They recently were bought by, uh, by Facebook uh, a little while back. Uh, but this is sort of using the muscles on the forearm to determine whether or not, uh, you know, which, which, which finger is being contracted. Um, here we have um, on 49, we have a, the next slide, we have a 
uh, another pretty commonly used task uh, for electroencephalography devices. This is using focus to essentially move the the uh, the 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 y-axis of the uh, of the drone here. So the idea is the more you focus, the higher the drone will go up. Uh, and that uses beta waves and alpha waves from the prefrontal cortex. Um, here we have um, a awesome uh, device, um, which is essentially, it's it's an exoskeleton that utilizes, I think it uses motor, motor imagery. Motor imagery, um, yep. Yeah, so the idea being, as this individual thinks about moving his, his feet, the actual, uh, uh, exoskeleton will move with servos and stuff, move that person forward. Uh, and this obviously has great potential for um, the use of uh, giving people back some mobility that are in locked in states, but it also could help with uh, military applications or industrial applications for like moving large objects um, and uh, basically allowing people to lift more than they're normally able to. Yeah, this is one of the things that uh, got me into brain computer interfacing and one cool thing. So there's a project called the walk again project, which I'm not sure if this video is from, I don't think that it is, but um, it's a similar idea. And they actually found that using motor imagery, having somebody very consciously try and focus on moving their, their limbs and then actually having it go through the motion can produce some, uh, some leg movement um, reliably in people who have had even severe paralysis. So um, it's very interesting to see that happening. Next, we have another uh, motor imagery task. Uh, this person is playing, I believe this is World of Warcraft, or um, I'm not exactly sure what game it is. Um, but the idea being that he imagines which direction he wants the character to move in, and it then moves in that direction. Uh, this is with electroencephalography. So these are all non-invasive devices. Uh, now we're going to get into some of the kind of cooler Showcase, uh, showcases of, of these, this technology, but these are more invasive uses. So everything you'll see from here on is all invasive brain computer interfaces. Um, but it sort of shows where we can go with this technology, right? Uh, this is using Neuralink's uh, newest version of their device to, for uh, basically the, the, the monkeys using it. Um, I believe they're using population coding here um, to control a um, Pong thing, uh, the Pong paddle. Um, and he's rewarded with a smoothie every time he wins, essentially. So, yeah, uh, and this yeah. is with an implanted device. It should be noted too that uh, this kind of stuff has been going on for a while. Um, this just generated a lot of buzz because it came from Neuralink and Elon Musk. Um, but if you're interested in looking at some brain gaming, I highly recommend you check out Nathan Copeland's YouTube channel, BCI, BCI Can Do Better, um, mm -hmm. where he plays games like Tetris and Pac-Man um, and like games like that and it's really interesting yeah, yeah. yeah we actually have nathan nathan's actually coming on to the uh our brainstream podcast uh he'll be in, in our episode next month uh so look forward to that if you're interested in uh hearing his experience with using invasive brain computer interfaces um here's uh somebody using this is brain gate i think uh right um this is somebody yeah, this utilizing... is johns hopkins but using um yeah using the, the utah array six mm -hmm. of them yep. Um, the idea here is that this individual is able to use motor imagery with an invasive brain computer interface to feed himself with these robotic arms. Um, so super cool technology here. Uh, let's talk about Nathan Tactile Copeland. Tactile sensation as well, which is which is interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was just going to say. So this this next slide is is actually with Nathan, Nathan Copeland. This is the guy that we uh, were just talking about, uh, and he's actually able to feel. So when the when when the uh, the researcher here presses a finger he's actually able to detect, like it actually sends an electrical impulse to his brain and he's actual, actually able to detect pressure from them pressing that individual finger. Uh, so this is providing a sensation with the brain computer interface, which is really, really, really cool. Especially when you think of, I mean, he was pretty much the first person to do this. He was uh, so the first person to do this, yeah. And in this video, which is the first demo that they put out, um, he was able to classify 19 out of 20 finger touches correctly between those four Very fingers. Cool. Um, so. It's and the idea being worthy. there that that he actually has a, an implant that's placed over his somatosensory cortex, uh, which once again is you, you stimulate a certain area based on whichever um, uh, finger is pressed. And here's using, I believe this is motor imagery. Um, no, so the, so this one is your your they're actually taking signals from the uh, from the nerves coming out. So they're um, using mm. reinnervated muscles, I believe that. Uh, so they put a put a nerve into a transplanted muscle, and then they're able to use that to control. 
to control the arm. Um, and then this is, uh, we're wrapping up here because I know we're coming up at one. Um, this is uh, also using that population coding, very similar to what we saw before, but just to show you another example of um, how well these arms are able to be used. Um, and then finally here, this is also using BrainGate system, um, the same one, the, the same idea with all of the last ones that we showed um, after the Neuralink one, um, using that population coding once again to move a cursor around on the screen and actually select letters. Um, so you see that there's a pretty high degree of accuracy here. Now it's important to note when we were talking with Nathan, um, he was telling us about uh, how this accuracy wanes over time and you really have to do pretty consistent training um, every couple days if you're if you're using this device because your brain state and how it does this changes so that's a big drawback but when it's working you can see it works quite well um, and just to wrap up here uh, we mentioned in the beginning that Colin and I worked on a course in collaboration with Neurotech X um, and so this course is called Foundations of Neurotechnology you can find it on your YouTube channel or on our YouTube channel BCI guys on YouTube um, or you can go to that Neurotech EDU um, and find the full course there, which includes the five hours of videos in addition to a bunch of written content. There's like over 120 pages of written content that we put up there as well, yeah, if you're really is, interested. This presentation is so. basically like a very basic short course, short course version of Neurotech EDU. So definitely if you're interested in learning about this stuff more in depth, check out the course. Yeah, definitely. And so as mentioned, it's on the Neurotech EDU platform, it's 100% free. And you've got nine lessons, which are shown here, which cover what is Neurotech, um, we go into some history. This was a really fun one where we did some skits and uh, animations. We give you a, a crash course in neuroscience. So it goes in a lot more depth than we talked about today. Types of neurotechnologies. Um, we go more into neuromodulation, which is one of my favorites. Um, brain computer interfacing and methods, which we talked about today. Um, and then we do some ethics, neurophilosophy, look into funding, um, and then give a summary and some other resources. So again, thank you so much um, to the organizers of this event and everyone listening for having us. Um, we always love to engage with the community. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of my screen share here and toss it back to the hosts. Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ray and Colleen. So very nice talk and with amazing visual and animation. It's very uh, pleased to, to follow. Uh, maybe we have a few minutes to uh, some questions from the audience. Yeah, absolutely. We have some reaction. Yeah, to, to Max, um, who said, I imagine uh, like it would feel weird at first for that tactile input. And we talked to Nathan about this um, in that podcast episode. And he said, um, like, it was fairly intuitive to pick up in terms of like, oh, it feels like you have uh, a signal there. But he said it felt more like tingling in these in these fingers. Um, and that would just be wild to, to feel. And I know that they've been working on this with non-invasive like TMS stimulation as well. So that might be a way that you could feel it. But um, yeah, it, it must be wild. And I've seen some research that um, has been working with proprioceptive input as well, and even pain, um, but just very, very low stimulation. And so it's kind of interesting to see that stuff emerging. Yeah, but we can take any other questions you guys might have. You can just throw them in the chat. We have about five minutes here. Yeah, and if questions don't emerge, I will ask a question of all of you because I'm curious <laughs> on some things. But but we'll give people another minute if they're typing. Uh, but yeah, we've really been pushing this uh, this podcast as sort of a longer uh, form um, content, uh, just to sort of experiment with some longer form content on YouTube. Um, and we had uh, Steven Grossberg on for our last episode. So I don't know if you guys are familiar at all with his, his work. Um, he's a pretty, pretty prominent uh, figure in the field. So if you're interested in sort of learning his story or anything as well, you know, you can check out the Brainstream podcast. It's on Spotify, it's on Stitcher, uh, it's on uh, Apple Podcasts, and it's on YouTube. Sweet. All right, question to pose to all of you then, which is my favorite question to ask neurotechnologists or just really anybody that's into biotech, um, which is what is your definition of a cyborg and are we cyborgs already? And if you have an answer to that, just put a brief thing in the chat. 
um, as we close this up here, because we have heard answers that range like all across the spectrum from like the Hollywood version of what that means, where like half your face is a, a robot and like, you know, half your body is a robot by a mechatronic view. And then others, I heard from someone on the very far end of the spectrum that anytime there's any tool use, um, that you are then a cyborg. And then she went into, she was like, even birds, when they use, when they build a nest and they use sticks, cyborg. And I just <laughs> thought that was, that was very funny. So, um, we have a question here. Yeah. Uh, the question is, do you have any more information about how this is being applied in video games uh, or the direction it'll take in the following years? So uh, there is one device that's being developed right now. I forget exactly what the company name is, um, but there's one device that's being developed um, as like a like a, a private company device, which is utilizes uh, as steady state visually evoked potentials uh, with virtual reality. The idea being that you can like look at a object that's flashing at a certain frequency, and then that selects the object for you while you're wearing a VR headset. Um, yeah. I I also know that OpenBCI recently partnered with Valve, which is super exciting to hear about, uh, and they're they're working on their Gala headset, uh, their Gala attachment oh, yeah. for their headset. Galia, yeah. yes, um, and uh, I'm sure they're they're working hard on that internally. Um, so I, I would definitely keep an eye on that in the next five years or so. I'd I'd be great to see, or I'd be really interested to see what 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 comes out of that. Yeah, I think that first company that you're referring to is NextMind. So they're using yes. SSVP. Yes. I would imagine, although I have no insider information, I, sh I should say, but I would imagine that OpenBCI is using uh, ERPs, probably some facial EMG. Um, and uh, SSVP just play, just based on the the um, where those electrodes are placed. But again, I do not know. Um, so that would be very cool. And then just in terms of applications, I know that there are some people working on detecting emotion and using that. Like imagine you're playing a game and you can see an emotional indicator above your teammates. Um, then also using focus modulation to to change uh, different elements of the game. And then even for some horror games, knowing exactly when to jump scare someone is uh, another thing, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so Dimitri mentions here um, that uh, he, used, he sent a, a, a quote from Wikipedia about uh, magnetoencephalography, uh, signals decaying over distance, specifically saying that the decay of uh, magnetic fields as a function of distance is more pronounced than for electric fields. That is true. Um, however, the, the real benefit from the magnetic uh, imaging technique is that they're able to, they're less distorted from physical layers of, um, of, of, of bio, bio, physical biological layers. So like the skull, the, the scalp, uh, those layers theoretically don't distort the, the signal as much as you will see from like a surface I mean, EEG. Yeah, so to the to the question of promising application of, of BCIs, um, I have two answers. So right now, I think it's neuromodulation devices, um, specifically for, for mental health. So you've had devices like DBS, deep brain stimulation, um, that has been used for, so on the motor side for like Parkinson's disease, but also um, there's a lot of promising research for severe depression and anxiety, um, bipolar disorder, uh, even help with addiction and obesity. So that's really interesting. And that has gotten FDA clearance and has been implanted in many thousands of people worldwide. Um, there are also non-invasive devices like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation that does this as well. But in the future, um, and I think this is kind of more in line with the, the series of talks that are here, um, I'm really, really passionate about the idea of making technology more human. So as I'm sitting here, you know, like we're all very used to dealing with data, maybe in spreadsheets, um, in their numerical form. Um, and I think that it would be really interesting to start adding multi-sensory components to this. So instead of looking at data and viewing data, can we feel data and have a more um, inclusive uh, understanding of what that is? Because really just experiencing emotion and consciousness is just a way that our brains simplify this tremendous amount of data that we're getting so that it's actually usable. Um, and you know, able to be interpreted. Yeah, so there are, uh, so Eduardo, for the deep brain stimulation, there are a ton of companies that are already doing this. The ones I would look at are um, Medtronic and Abbott. Um, like it has been planted, implanted in, I, I want to say over 100,000 people, although um, don't quote me on that, but it's definitely up there. Um, this device has been around, these devices have been around for um, 10, 15 years now um, as, a, as a medical device. So Check that out.
Cool. I think that's. I think we're running up on time here. Yeah. Cool. Well, once again, thank you guys so much for having us uh, for this presentation. It was it was great to chat uh, and sort of spread some uh, awareness here of uh, how this stuff works. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, both of you, and uh, very nice uh, presentation again. And, uh, and yeah, see you maybe uh, next time. And uh, yeah. yeah, I can certainly also uh, with uh, next mind. So that's a French startup, and uh, I, I I think it's it's is VAP uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we don't have the opportunity yet to test it in in the Paris chapter, but uh, we we know some guys who have it. So maybe soon oh, in cool. the coming weeks. Yeah, and that's definitely mostly a video game application. So yeah, to answer that question before, very cool. I didn't know they were French. That's awesome. Okay, see you and have a nice day. And you, you can too. stay also for, for the other talk if you want. And um, I will, I'm happy to welcome so no Pierre Clisson and Sylvain Chevalier on the, on the floor. And uh, yeah, you, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for now. So uh, I will start the presentation and uh, this is uh, this was a really nice uh, talk from the BCI guys, and uh, uh, in what I will uh, present here is a, a deeper dive into um, the biosensing um, into the biosensing with uh, an open science uh, take. So I will speak more about the uh, machine learning magics and uh, all the ideas that you could uh, use to uh, apply uh, on um, uh, BCI data and uh, or biosensor. And uh, I will take um, a more offline perspective to explain how it's possible to uh, use machine learning on uh, existing data sets. And uh, afterwards, uh, Pierre will uh, introduce where to do it online and to make real BCI. Because uh, what I will present is more like uh, uh, analysis, offline analysis, um, in the purpose of making a nice BCI. So here, uh, so I'm working in um, Université Paris-Saclay. Uh, and I'm um, developing uh, lots of tools, uh, especially for uh, pushing open source uh, solution for BCI research, because reproducible work has, um, are very difficult uh, in the existing literature. So you could heard about very nice approaches, but usually the code is not available. Um, if the people are sharing data, most of the time, unfortunately, the um, data are stored in diff difficult uh, data format to access, or they need to install special toolboxes that are quite uh, difficult. And um, sometimes even the, the data are um, proposed with uh, error including inside. So it's very difficult when you heard about a new data set or a new approach or a new uh, algorithm to know how does it compare with other data set, other uh, algorithm. And um, many people are re-implementing uh, all these uh, BCI pipelines and uh, and the um, algorithm, and it's, it's a huge waste of time for every, everyone. So with the help of the um, NeuroTechX uh, people, um, the mother of all BCI benchmark, uh, so Moai Vivi, uh, was set up to be like a standard benchmark for any new paper. So that big goal objective, uh, the, big, uh, the big objective. The idea is to propose a comprehensive benchmark of uh, the popular BCI algorithm and to give access to many freely available uh, EEG data. So when data sets are um, in, put in open data to be able to download it and to use it. And with the benchmark to have a fair way to rank algorithm for a fair evaluation. So 
to do all this, it's really important to uh, build it on top of uh, very um, strong and very, um, uh, how do I say, reliable uh, 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 ecosystem. And um, what is uh, possible here is uh, to build it on um, a, a very uh, cool toolbox that is called MNE. And that has a very long history uh, based on uh, C code and uh, put in Python since 2010. The idea of this uh, toolbox is to give many possible um, algorithm and many uh, way of looking, uh, trying to infer what is it the signal or to apply a statistical analysis and all of this in um, in one uh, big toolbox. So there are more than 100 contributors, many line of code, and the code base is very, very mature. So it works on all kinds of uh, OSs, and also you could use it um, in any kind of uh, work, like um, it's a BSD license, so it's okay for use it in commercial product or in uh, research or in whatever uh, kind of application you want. So uh, uh, on top of using MNE, uh, it's important to be able to be compliant with uh, all the machine learning standards. So, um, the, okay, this is a, a kind of application of uh, MNE. So you could see there are many uh, visualization. And um, it's important to be able to plug all these uh, way to make sense of the brain signal into some um, machine learning pipelines. So uh, to do that, we uh, build MoABB uh, with a, uh, an API that is compatible with scikit-learn, so very famous and very accessible machine learning uh, toolbox. So even if you don't not if you do not know any uh, machine learning at all, uh, this toolbox is really made uh, to be uh, usable very simply. There are lots of tutorial, many um, application to to use it, and um, it's it's very open. And still the um, all the code quality and uh, uh, efficiency is very at the heart of the um, guiding principle for the software designer. So it's really a, a really a cool um, a cool toolbox. Uh, also with a BSD license, so you could use it in um, whatever kind of uh, application you want. And uh, to show you an example, it's very um, direct. So one kind of very uh, efficient uh, classifier to, to, uh, to use is known as SVM, so for Support Vector Machine. Um, it allows to uh, predict the, the class of, uh, of a new item given some training uh, data. Uh, so here, you just need to... Uh, called the uh, implementation of uh, sklearn for uh, svm uh, you define your classifier you just need to fit the classifier on training data training data come with known labels so you know what kind of uh, classes are each uh, sample and from that you could predict um, test data so you have a, a label uh, prediction uh, for all your uh, test data. So it's very, uh, very, very straightforward. Um, we use this uh, scikit-learn because um, there are many algorithms. So here shown on a different kind of uh, applicative, uh, different kind of uh, toy example uh, with different type of data distribution. And there are numerous um, numerous algorithm already available. So the, the main goal of uh, MoABB is to build on this MNE uh, format and uh, all the scikit-learn uh, machine learning pipeline to be able to uh, give a way to make simple benchmarks. So 
the central notion uh, in MoEDB is the data sets. So you could download open data uh, from the internet. It will be stored on your computer and convert in MNE format. So you could use it um, in any way you want uh, afterward. So you could just use MoEDB to download data and to use it uh, if you want to, uh, to make some exploration or to use it uh, with your uh, favorite um, machine learning uh, uh, algorithm. And if you want, uh, it's also possible to use MoEDB to do some fair uh, benchmark. In that case, there are a paradigm. So right now we are uh, implementing um, different kinds of uh, BCI that were introduced by the BCI guys before. So there are motor imagery data sets, um, spellers based on uh, ERP, so P300 uh, uh, potentials and uh, SSVP, so steady state visually evoked potential that were also uh, in, a, in a previous example. So a paradigm allowed to import uh, some known preprocessing for the specific kind of uh, paradigm you want to, to use. And afterward, you could define an evaluation. So the evaluation will be conducted on several data sets using a specified paradigm. And you could throw uh, uh, the pipeline you want. So pipeline are simple uh, Escalern uh, uh, pipeline. Um, and um, they use the scikit-learn uh, API. And with that, you could do some um, uh, evaluation of the result using different uh, statistical uh, analysis uh, tool or to uh, make nice visualization. And all the results are stored in a data frame. So it's very easy to uh, use them uh, in your, uh, to use them uh, in different, uh, different way to, to visualize them. So the, the goal is to have a fair and uh, reproducible benchmark. So here you have an example of plot that you could obtain after evaluating many, uh, many after evaluating pipelines on many data sets. What is kind of uh, interesting, uh, this is really interesting because uh, all the um, data sets often have a limited number of subjects. So by combining multiple data sets, it's possible to make a meta-analysis to have better understanding if one approach is consistently better uh, than another on different kind of sensor, different kind of uh, amplifier or uh, hardware or uh, uh, different kind of subjects. So this is the, the goal of uh, MoABB. So since um, last year, there was many uh, development. Uh, MoABB was part of a uh, uh, data competition uh, in the famous uh, NeurIPS uh, conference. Um, the competition was called BTOL AI, so for making transfer learning in BCI. Uh, also, um, we have added support for the latest Python, MNE, and Escalern um, uh, version. There are new data sets, so we even added new data set today. So there are uh, uh, six SSVP and uh, not two, but uh, four, uh, five new uh, ERP data sets uh, added today and uh, one another uh, motor imagery. So there are really like a bunch of um, data sets and uh, many pipelines for SSVP or ERP. And uh, all of that is uh, very easy to use. Uh, so this is really like a community effort, a build of the work of uh, many. So the, the founder of this initiative are uh, Alexandre Barachan and Vinay Jayaram. They are now working with uh, Facebook uh, Reality Labs, but uh, still the, the work is uh, um, continued. So I maintain the Moab toolbox, but uh, with the help of so many others, uh, some are in there in pictures, others uh, uh, are just on the text. 
And uh, if you want, it's really open a uh, bit to add some documentation or to help us to integrate new data sets that you knew about or to add new pipeline or there are really many ways to, to help and it's, it's really open. So to contribute, uh, there are um, a GitHub website with all the documentation that is also available. Um, <clears throat> the um, GitHub uh, help us to track <clears throat> all the changes and uh, to discuss uh, live about uh, how to uh, use it or uh, some use case. Uh, we have um, synchronous office hours. So right now they are every uh, Wednesdays uh, uh, at different uh, time, um, time frame for the different uh, uh, people in the world. So it's possible to find uh, one uh, Wednesday that match your uh, time zone. And uh, for offline uh, and asynchronous uh, exchange, we use a uh, guitar. So it's uh, very, uh, very open. Um, so if I have the, the time, I will uh, show you a quick uh, example. So um, here, uh, this, um, here is uh, one quick example. So um, in MoABB, oh, I will make it uh, bigger. So in MoABB, you have a um, data set. So it's very easy to import data set. Um, one very common and known data set is the data set from the BCI competition uh, three, the data set, uh, uh, it's called uh, 4A. So this is this one. Um, hosted on the BNCI Horizon uh, website. So to use this data set, you just need to declare it. So from moebb.dataset, import the data set you want. And um, it's already possible to get the data directly. So when using the um, method uh, get data, you will get the data from the subject you want. Uh, so here we'll just download the data set from one subject. It's already downloaded on my computer, so it will be fast. But uh, if it's not the case, uh, you just uh, download it right away. And um, most of the interesting um, aspect of MoABB is that it will turn it into uh, MNE object. So with this uh, MNE object, it's very easy to have the number of uh, EEG channel. So there are EOG, there is a stimulus channel. So you could really use um, all the raw data as you want, uh, if you want to make a specific uh, exploration. So um, one um, visible uh, outcome it, is that it's possible to use MNE uh, function to explore your plot. So for example, to have a better idea on how the sensors are distributed in this specific data set, um, the specific uh, function plot sensors allows to, to see um, how the uh, electrodes are put on the, on the head. And um, it's also possible to see what does the EEG look like. So here, this is the raw dot plot that allows to plot the different uh, EEG uh, channels. And uh, if you use it on your computer, it's even possible to have uh, with Qt to have a, a functional um, exploration. Like it's possible to move in the time or to uh, focus or make uh, access bigger. Um, so in this notebook, I didn't activate the, the functionality. So it's just a, a flat plot. Uh, it's also possible to see uh, the power spectral density to have a better grasp of the different um, uh, frequency uh, that you could see uh, that are related with the, the frequency introduced previously by the BCI guys. Here you see, uh, for example, some peak around, um, uh, around 12 or 13 hertz. So this is exactly in the alpha band. So this is uh, related with the, um, uh, with the motor imagery. Um, good, because it's uh, what the, um, this uh, data set is about. And um, so 
it's possible to get beyond this exploration to, to test different data. So to do this, you have um, the ability to use paradigm. So here we want just to make a left hand, right hand uh, motor imagery task. So there is the paradigm for that. And we will add not one, but two data sets um, to have a multiple uh, data set. So here I used another data set, which is very easy because there are only uh, four subjects. So it's very uh, small to download and to use. Um, as I told you, it's possible to use a scikit-learn uh, pipeline. So we will define a very basic, uh, basic machine learning pipeline uh, that is composed of uh, one uh, common sub, uh, uh, CSP, uh, common spatial patterns. So that try to extract some meaningful pattern from the many electrode and to return only uh, eight. Uh, surrogate electrode that are where the, 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 the motor imagery is, is more visible and to use a simple um, scikit, um, a simple scikit estimator, a classifier that is called linear discriminant analysis. So by combining the two, we have now our pipeline that we could apply uh, for a specific evaluation. So here to get a, a better grasp of the um, of the of the evaluation, so um, I already computed the result the results, so it's very uh, very fast here. But depending on the number of data, it could be uh, more or less uh, long. Um, and to visualize the results, you have the result as a data frame in pandas. So it's very easy to use nice uh, visualization package like Seaborn to to make some nice plot. So here we see that for some subjects, we are close to uh, one uh, in accuracy. So that the best score achievable. And for other, we are around the, the, the chance level. So it really depends on the subject. So I'm done with my presentation and I will leave the, the ground for, uh, for Pierre to, um, to text the, the next step. Thank you, Sylvain, and thanks, uh, Romain, and the wonderful team of NeuroTechX for organizing this event and for your uh, continuous uh, support to the NeuroTech community. So let me share my screen. So now you will see more uh, online analysis. <laughs> yep. And now that you've learned uh, everything you need to know about uh, BCI from the BCI guys and biofeedback from uh, Yelena yesterday and that you know how to select the best algorithm for your project since now you you know how to use uh, Moabibi. Uh, we will see how to build uh, real life applications and but first let's review the general principles that govern uh, such applications uh, i won't review everything of course because uh, the bci guys has, have um, really well summed up uh, the principles of erp how neuron fire etc etc so what i want to focus on is the closed loop and this is one of the most essential concept you need to know uh, for building BCIs or um, biosense uh, applic application in general. So these are the typical steps you will find in uh, any application. So first, we need to extract uh, the signal data from the biosensors. So it can come from EEG and you will collect brain waves. It can come from uh, ECG or PPG for the heart activity. EDF for electrodermal activity, EMG for muscles uh, or nerves, etc. etc. And um, then we often need to, to clean the signal, to filter the signal, to process the signal in some way. So we can use it to extract features and uh, meaningful uh, metrics and information from this uh, raw signal. 
and then often we need to uh, feed this information into a model, a machine learning model that we use to recognize pattern, whatever we want to recognize, and then we feed this information back to the user through an interface. And this interface can be anything. It can be sound, it can be images from a computer or a phone screen, it can be a prosthetic arm, a robot, it can be a 3D scene in a VR headset, haptic feedback, or whatever, whatever you can um, imagine. And it needs a simple simplest form, a typical neurofeedback application would look like this. So I have an um, EEG headset on my head and we simply monitor the alpha activity from my brain and when I close my eyes we can see a surge of alpha waves and we, cap we capture this signal and the system provides feedback here in the form of sound. So please pay attention uh, to the sound as I play this uh, very short video. Okay, and uh, this is uh, the underlying ar architecture behind this very simple demo. Um, as you can see, we can uh, see here that we still get a signal from the EG through a protocol that is called LSL. It's not that important for now. We apply a rolling window and extract the frequency uh, bands, and then we send the data back through OSC, which is another uh, network protocol, to a sonic engine that plays sounds that the user uh, can hear. At the same time, we decide to record both the raw data and the frequency bands and for this we send the data to a broker and the bro broker uh, send the data to another um, process which is responsible for recording the data into a database or a file so um, all you can uh, all you have seen in uh, this uh, pipeline this typical pipeline, uh, we have an open source project that you can follow and build your own neurofeedback applications from. So it uh, can serve as a basis to build more complex and more integrated uh, solutions. And indeed, we can go further. This is a project that was done using Timeflux for Open Mind Neurotechnologies, which is a company that provides uh, cognitive and emotional assessment through VR, as well as uh, soft uh, skills training such as relaxation, concentration and uh, interoception. So on the photos you can see that uh, she's wearing a respiration belt, although probably a little bit uh, too low, but I guess it was for the photo. And she is wearing also a PPG sensor to measure, it's an indirect way of measuring um, cardiac activity and EDA sensor to measure um, basically the perspiration that can be a very good in, indicative of um, some emotion, stress, etc. Uh, so again, I won't repeat what has already been been said about how neuron fire, about ERPs and brain waves. So let's focus about the tools that we use to build actual BCI and other biosensing application. Here, Timeflux is the tool we use. And Timeflux is an open source Python framework uh, that we can use to acquire and process biosignals in real time. It's uh, written in Python, so it can run on uh, Linux, macOS, and Windows. We can use it to many things. You can use it to acquire data from uh, multiple sources at the same time. We can use it to uh, present stimulus to the user and it's very important in some cases to have a very uh, precisely uh, synchronized stimuli. Uh, we can use it to build biofeedback application, uh, BCIs, interactive installations, art installations, and so on and so on. It works with 
many kinds of devices. We natively support OpenBCI, Vitalino, uh, ANT Neuro, uh, Gaze Point, uh, for, uh, which is uh, an eye tracker, um, MindMedia Nexus, which is a multimodal application system, and even force platforms uh, that we used, uh, that we needed for our project. And we also support uh, the BrandFlow library and the lab streaming layer protocol, so you can access tens of devices out of the box. So why did we build uh, TimeFlux in the first place? First, we wanted something uh, that fits well within the Python data science ecosystem with a truly open source license. So you can use TimeFlux in the commercial settings and some, something that works uh, both offline and online. Um, so this allows you to quickly prototype and test new ideas without having to go deep into C++ code. You can really uh, go uh, very fast from the ID to the actual uh, product. And uh, TimeFlux is easy to learn, to use, and to extend. It uses uh, familiar concepts that you may uh, already know about. And if it's not the case, uh, you'll see that you can uh, grab this concept uh, pretty quickly. It relies on industry standards such as pandas for 2D data, XRF for multidimensional data, scikit-learn that Sylvain mentioned for machine learning, LSL, lab streaming layer for synchronizing uh, multiple data streams. And so you don't need to learn new tools if you already do data science with uh, Python. And uh, you don't need to be a hardcore programmer either. And you don't even need to be a programmer in most of the case, and you can use uh, a descriptive uh, YAML syntax to uh, program, to describe your, your, your pipelines. And if you want to go further, uh, everything is just simple standard Python class. So it's very easy to extend. So we tried our best to build uh, some good doc documentation and um, and tutorials. It's not perfect yet, but um, you can I really invite you to go to the documentation uh, website doc.timeflux.io, and you can follow um, you can follow the the tutorials and see the API documentation with illustrations, etc., etc. We even have uh, more details about uh, the neurofeedback application I just uh, showed you. And TimeFlux comes with everything you need to get started, uh, including uh, multiple networking protocols. And this is very important because this is what allow you to communicate with all kinds of applications. So you can communicate with uh, web browsers uh, using WebSocket. You can communicate with 2D and 3D um, application uh, or game engines uh, such as Unity with either LSL or OSC, etc. And you can communicate also with Sonic installation, or AR applications, etc. Et uh, you can record and replay uh, your uh, data files. We have everything you need to get to do some uh, basic uh, DSP. Of course, we can do machine learning, aka uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, in real time. Uh, we provide a uh, simple web user interface uh, that allows you to monitor the raw signals and also provides um, a few basic web applications. It also comes with a lot of tools to do uh, multi-dimensional matrix uh, manipulation. I already mentioned the drivers uh, to uh, get uh, the, uh, the data from the devices, the sub-millisecond synchronization that can be very important in ERP research. And if you are a developer, we have a de debugging tools uh, that allows you to understand what happens when something goes wrong. And you can plug it to 
other application before or after an acquisition. It's very useful in a research setting when, for example, you want to automatically upload the data to a cloud uh, afterwards or something. Um, and if that's not enough, you can develop your own plugins using a very simple Python API. And this is an example of, um, of a plugin we released uh, the past year. It's a um, real-time EEG denoising algorithm based on something called the artifact subspace reconstruction method, but uh, using Riemannian geometry. Uh, so I won't go into details, uh, but um, you can check the, the website. And it was mostly developed by uh, Louis Koskowski under the supervision of uh, Sylvain Chevalier with the help of Raphael Bertrand Lalo, another uh, contributor to the project. And it's very useful to uh, remove movement artifacts. All you need is one minute of clean signal at the beginning of the acquisition. And you may already have noticed that uh, this is uh, web browsers. And yeah, uh, we can use um, web interfaces written in standard HTML and JavaScript. But of course, you don't have to. You can use any of the uh, networking protocol available to interact with your favorite framework or game engine. These are just a few examples. So we, are, we can uh, you can monitor the raw signal here. It's a P, um, very simple P300 uh, sperder. I will show you a more complex one uh, a bit later. And um, just a simple application to monitor the quality of the electrodes, uh, the, the contact quality of the contact of the electrodes. And this one was uh, really built in like uh, 20 minutes. And most of the time, uh, that was uh, to find a suitable SVG image. So it's really easy. And all these web interfaces, you can do this with a simple JavaScript API, which is made to be as unobtrusive as possible, and uh, that you can use to receive and send data streams and events in real time, and to deliver very precisely scheduled stimuli uh, suitable for SSVP and ERP research. Uh, this is very important. Okay, so all of this is very exciting, but um, how does it work in practice? So one of the core concepts is uh, the DAGs, the Directed Acyclic uh, Graphs. And in TimeFlux, we use these DAGs to process data streams. So basically, a DAG is a set of nodes connected by edges where information flows, and this is very important, in one given direction without any loop. Uh, so there are many details we, we could go into, but if we need to uh, remember one thing is that each node is a processing unit. For example, in the first node, we will acquire data from an EEG, then we will apply a passbound filter or something, and then we send the data to another process to do a machine learning or something, and uh, you, you, you get the, the ID. And this is very simple uh, graph with only four nodes, and this is how you would translate this graph into YAML. So it's really easy. Um, so you can see that uh, there is one graph, which is called Hello World, with one, two, three, four nodes. And what we can do is we just connect the nodes together. So you can see that I connect the random nodes to the display uh, before nodes. We also connect the random node to the add node, and we connect the add node to the display after node. So this is really a trivial example to show you how, how it works. But uh, the, here, the general idea is that we just generate some random data. We display 
this random data and at the same time we add one to every value of this random data and we also display the data on the, the console. So it's really a simple example, trivial example, but I hope it uh, helps you to understand how it works. But uh, remember when we talked about the closed loop uh, principle earlier. So how can we build the closed loop if uh, the directed acyclic graph don't, does not allow loops? Well, it's quite simple. We have multiple loops running at the same time and this, uh, this uh, process, these different uh, nodes communicate together uh, in a not synchronous way through a broker. I won't go into details. Um, there are many uh, details and information on the website and the tutorial on the documentation website. Um, one thing to remember though is that nodes in a graph run in a sequential way and multiple graphs run in parallel. Okay. Don't worry uh, if you didn't grab everything, you can have a look at the website. Everything is here. And um, okay, so I'd like now to go into a, uh, a more complex uh, example. And this is a real life P300 uh, spiller, a state of the art P300 spiller that allows you to communicate with your mind only. Basically, it's a virtual keyboard. And if you remember the, the presentation from the BCI guys, when you focus on one character, and if this character flash, then there will be a distinctive spike in the brain that we can uh, recognize and classify. So this specific application uh, runs in a web browser. It is fully configurable. You can uh, configure uh, the character set, the layout, uh, the classification algorithms that we use, etc. Et um, so how does it work? Well, uh, here you can see that we have one, two, um, five graphs. The first one is uh, responsible to acquire uh, the data from the EEG applying some uh, filtering so we apply notch filter a bandpass filter and we have two nodes that publish publish both the raw data and the filtered data to a broker to a proxy uh, at the same time we have um, the record node that get uh, the data and save this to a file for later analysis and the user interface where we um, get the data both for monitoring, but also to, um, uh, to, uh, to get events from the classification graph. And the classification graph get the data. It uh, cut, uh, cut off the, um, the, the raw signals into multiple uh, bits called epochs. Everything passes through a classification pipelines, which is uh, fully compatible with uh, scikit-learn. And we have another node which uh, de decides when we have enough data uh, to uh, say that we are confident enough to make a prediction. And we send this data back to the proxy and the proxy send this data back to the uh, user interface in the user interface say, okay, I see that you meant to focus on the character O, for, in, for instance. So I'd like to show you a quick video uh, to show you how it works in practice. So I launch time flux. First, the first thing I do is just check that the signal is correct. I'll go a little bit further. So it's a very simple. Here you can see uh, that these are very specific and recognizable um, waveforms. Uh, these are alpha waves that you can obtain when you close your eyes. 
and you can also see that uh, the signal is very sensitive. This is when I blink. And then, so on the left, you have a time flux uh, running. Uh, you can see some congestion uh, messages. It's because uh, I'm recording the, um, the video at the same time and it, all, it takes all the CPU. So um, <laughs> it's a bit uh, lagging on the, on the time flux side uh, because of this. And on the right, so we have our speller. So the first thing we need when we do a P300 speller or any machine learning for that purpose is uh, to classify uh, the data. So we need to acquire some data and the labels that correspond to this data. So here I have some tasks and the users is tasked to focus on the T and now on the I. So I focus on the I each time the character flashes I record this data. I also record when the data is not flashing on this character. And with all this, I can train a machine learning model. Uh, you can also see that we use a smiley uh, instead of just flashing uh, the character, because uh, in addition to the pure P300 speller, uh, this is another uh, waveform that we want to exploit is uh, the face recognition uh, pattern. It's another ERP and us humans are hardwired to recognize uh, faces. So uh, it's very uh, useful when we want to uh, classify uh, things. Okay, I'll go a little bit further. Okay, so now we have uh, classif uh, we have a um, trend or model so it takes a few seconds. Here it takes nearly eight seconds, but again, it's because the CPU was used by the video. Otherwise, it takes only two or three seconds using uh, Riemannian geometry. And then we start the free spelling. So uh, here I'm just looking at random characters. Not random, it's actually the character I want to, 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 to write. So you can say, you can see them uh, written in the screen at the same time. And when the computer is confident enough to make a prediction, it outputs uh, the character. So I will go further, and I guess you uh, understood where I wanted to go. And I just spelled hello world with my mind. So this is something that is cool. No? And everything is uh, in Python and you can, uh, oops, you can reproduce everything because uh, everything is on our website, on our uh, GitHub uh, pages. Uh, so Timeflux is uh, the main uh, repository where you can have everything. There is another repo which is useful, it is uh, the UI uh, repo. And the demos are here. Actually, the demos that are really finished and uh, published, etc. So we have a neurofeedback, we have a hyperscanning demo, we have a, a spiller, this spiller P3, P300. So you have some documentation, you have the pipeline, uh, you have uh, the um, rep um, YAML representation with the different uh, machine learning uh, pipeline you, you, you want to use. Uh, just for the example, so you don't need um, you don't need an EEG to, to run the demo, it's just using a random data by default. And of course, you'll get uh, random predictions also, but you can easily plug uh, an OpenBCI headset or any other headset. Uh, you can use LSL as well. <coughs> and I will drink some water if I don't want to die on the internet. <coughs> and um, yeah, I think that's all, and we are on time, so I will <coughs> close Sorry, uh, this browser and come back to 
Oops, uh, I'm not sure how to do this. Okay. Uh -huh. So I'll just come back to the conclusion because we have other things uh, to cover and to, uh, to, to on our roadmap. So uh, the core of TimeFlux is quite stable. So the next step is to make everything easier to use. We are well aware that uh, some users find it uh, quite intimidating to use uh, the command line so and to install all the dependencies, Python dependencies, etc. So we want to build a self-contained bundle with zero effort installation. You download, you click, and it works. A new uh, guy <coughs> to easily manage and write your, your pipelines. A faster monitoring interface. Uh, right now it's based on CPU. We want to make something that use, uh, uses uh, the, the GPU. We want to, uh, in, um, to have a better documentation and, be and most tutorial. And we also want to publish more demos and examples. Actually, if you uh, look at all the repo. You, you'll find a lot, lot of bits uh, here and there. You, there are there, there are SSV EP demo. There are um, EMG demos, ECG classifications, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, most of it is um, buried in some repos and sometimes um, unmaintained uh, branches. So we need to clean everything and put it with documentation in the main uh, demo repository. And we also want to integrate with more um, software and hardware. Um, another exciting avenue for TimeFlux is um, the Neurogate IO uh, project, which is a NEG amplifier with uh, superpowers, uh, which has high performance, research grade, uh, it's a research grade EEG system suitable for advanced application uh, at an affordable price. It won't be open source, and I can't tell you much about all uh, the exciting features uh, right now because it's still uh, patent pending. Uh, we have a working prototype. We don't expect to be able to release it uh, publicly before uh, the summer, though, because, you know, I guess you're aware about the global uh, semiconductor uh, shortage. So we are really excited about this. Please go to the website, uh, re register your email, and we'll send you information as soon as we have. And um, finally, if you need help, uh, you can go to the website. There is a link to the documentation. If you want to report bug, there is uh, the GitHub uh, repo. We have a Slack channel, and you are really welcome to, to ask any question here. And uh, if you need professional help, consulting services are also available. So thanks a lot, and maybe we have time for a few questions. Thank you, Pierre and Sylvain. Uh, we can take five minutes also to take questions. Very nice presentation with a fun demo and, and so on. It's always cool to, to see also uh, open source projects. Thank you, Roma. So did you just die, Pierre, or <laughs> are you still okay? No, I don't know why. My uh, okay. shirt went uh, very dry and uh, maybe it's mm. excitement. Yeah. <laughs> so if uh, no one has any question at least for now i'd like to know what is your um profile guys are you developers are you uh researchers are you just basically interested and curious about bci I don't know if we will have some uh, <laughs> answers. I, I tried to respond about the, the question uh, before uh, from the VCI guys about the, the um, how uh, 
sorry, the cyborg, uh, what is the definition of a cyborg? But uh, it was a tough question. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, lots of response. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I, I had a, 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 yeah, some kind of a, a definition for a cyborg. Um, and I, I think that's when you try to transform. So it could be augmentation or changing the input or the output of a human. And for me, a condition that is very important is that it should be used in everyday life. That uh, it should be really like accepted, uh, accepted into your, uh, yeah, in your uh, every every day's activity. <laughs> yeah, what were you saying, Arison? Oh, I was just saying, yeah, it's super interesting how people answer those questions because like just what you were saying, you could say that like a smartphone makes you a cyborg because you use it every single day and you like put your memories into it, you know, and we, use a lot of our cognition like where we used to have to do a lot more mental math now we just calculator ask siri ask you know google assistant whatever so i just i i love hearing people's answers to those questions because it's really tough and nobody has the same answer but, <laughs> yes. but i i love these presentations that was really cool i'm going to check out those resources for sure because that looks like it makes uh you know some of the classification and coding a lot easier so i'm definitely going to use this it does. Yeah, good. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Lucas. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for your feedback. Uh, I know it's uh, it's um, it's something we really need to work on. Uh, for 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 the moment, we we uh, wanted to um, uh, to focus on the features first and to make sure that we can reproduce uh, state of the art research. And this was our focus for the past two years or three years. And I am very well aware that we need to uh, to give more attention to the WYSIWYG, as you say, or um, the graphical uh, interfaces. So this is really something we want to, to focus our attention on. And uh, maybe if you, if you, I don't know, if you're a developer, you, you can always uh, jump in and uh, help us. And uh, you know, uh, this is also something I mentioned on uh, other talks. But uh, uh, the important thing, I, I mean, we all uh, have works beside uh, this open source project. Uh, we 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 give a lot of our time to to this project, and it's not always easy to um, to balance everything. And uh, um, and this is why we we try to 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 focus also on uh, to have uh, some revenue stream as um, open source project, and uh, one way of doing this is uh, working with uh, we want to to, to start selling uh, EEG hardware and um, so yeah when we have this we'll be able to. Um, to, if, you have, if, if it works and we are able to, to get some money, we may be able to uh, dedicate more resources to the graphical user interface, etc. But uh, okay, Lucas, uh, uh, I think you, we already discussed on the Slack channel, so let's get in touch and uh, maybe we, we can work something out. And uh, one small question for you, Pierre. Is it uh, complicated to combine uh, different uh, modalities? So it's called sometimes called uh, a hybrid BCI. So when you use uh, brand signal, but uh, also different kind of uh, bio signal like uh, EMG or uh, maybe uh, other uh, other uh, input. Uh, how um, how could be integrated uh, within uh, time flux? So yeah, as you remember, it's all based it's all based on uh, DAGs on uh, graphs. So you can have uh, different nodes: one node to acquire EEG data, another node uh, to um, acquire other modalities. I don't know what you refer to. Maybe it can be ECG, maybe or, or other uh, brainwave 
uh, signals yeah. I don't know. and um, or EDA then, or yeah sorry or e EDA or yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, okay yeah. and then your choice is uh, to you need to know how you want to classify this data I guess uh, it won't make much sense to merge the two data set together but uh, probably you can train uh, two models at the same time on the two data set and then use a third model maybe <coughs> i'm dying again uh, just a simple uh, logistic regression to compile <coughs> the data from the two data set and um, yeah like an ensemble yeah. approach to uh, to yeah. combine both of the of the modalities yeah it's really uh it's really nice to be able to combine different uh, different modalities um, because um, often BCI is really restricted only on the um, uh, on the brand signal that is very uh, nice, but um, it's also very important to be able to uh, incorporate different uh, source of uh, information. Yeah, and from the um, from the answers uh, I see in the chat, I think very nice that a uh, lot of people are interested and trying to, um, uh, yeah, trying to experiment with it. So uh, I think uh, well, both um, the toolboxes are really meant to be uh, used by uh, anyone interested, even just to to mess a little bit around and to to try different uh, different stuff. You you don't need to be a, a specialist or to have a PhD or to be um, um, to, to be an academic to to use this. Uh, and I think on the contrary, it's very important that uh, uh, this uh, field is keep uh, open and. Uh, like uh, citizen science and open science. So it's really uh, something that matters in your uh, uh, perspective. Seems to be a good conclusion on that, on this <laughs> session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so thanks again, Romain, for all the organization. And uh, I thank you for inviting us again. And uh, thank you for all of you attendees to to show up and hopefully you will get uh, in touch again thank you thank you also Sylvia and Pierre and see you soon and just before to continue on Martin's presentation maybe I will propose to you to take a short break maybe five minute break a time to take a glass of water or maybe have a little chat on on this discussion on the chat and uh, we'll be back in like five minutes if it's okay for you Okay, hello Martin. Hello. Yes, so you are the third and last speaker and uh, to close also the, this uh, XR Biosense event and uh, you are from GTEC, a company in uh, Austria. And uh, so I just give you the floor directly to, to introduce yourself and, and make your presentation. All right, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So hi, my name is Martin. I'm software developer at GTEC, and I'm mainly responsible for the development of the unicorn, as well as for the project management of the unicorn. And I'm involved in some other projects at GTEC too. And my topic for today is biosensors and the future of XR. So I'm going to give you a little insight into the projects that we've done already at GTEC that might be possible and about the integrations and combinations with VR, AR, and different XR devices. And that's where I'm going to start. So a short overview of X reality or XR devices um, that are commonly used right now. So I guess most of you guys know virtual reality glasses um, where the user is 
only seeing the screen uh, presented by the devices. Also very commonly used are augmented reality uh, applications where you render something into the real world. And there are some mixed um, realities and assisted re reality applications where you have a mixture of these uh, two technologies. And especially in the last few years, we see more and more awareness and requests for um, combining PCIs with this uh, or biosignals with this technology. Um, that's where we uh, get into the, this whole topic uh, from GTEC. So at GTEC, we mainly build hard and software with a focus on biosignaling, mainly on uh, brain computer interfaces. And here you can see a couple of devices that we do have for different uh, applications. So at the very top, you can see some medical grade uh, amplifiers like the USB amp, where you have 16 input channels and you can plug in all kinds of different sensors like EG sensors, but also EMG sensors or ECG or for any other biosignal that you want to track and you can uh, measure as an electrical potential. Then underneath with the, with, uh, in blue, there's the high end where you can measure up to 256 channels and up to a sampling rate of over 30 kilohertz. So this is also mainly used in medical applications where we apply um, EG sensors um, to the brain high density grids uh, directly, like for ECOG applications. And on the right hand side, you can see two wireless systems that we have, also for med medical or research applications mainly. Um, the G Nautilus, the top one is uh, an EG only device. And we already heard previously that there are hybrid PCIs available. That's what you can see. Uh, on the bottom here. Um, that's a hybrid PCI where we have the combination of FNIRs with EEG. That's also something um, that is commonly uh, done in research. And on the very bottom, you can see the, the unicorn. Um, that's our research or consumer grade PCI. Um, that I will mainly focus on for this talk since it's the best fitting solution for AR, VR, and uh, consumer grade or research applications. And we also do software at GTEC. And here you can also see um, some, uh, some overview. So you can see some standalone application with a user interface on the top left, like the unicorn speller. We already uh, have heard about P300 spellers in the talks previously. So this is an application that we have for the, for the unicorn where you can um, use the application to spell words, write letters, but you can also modify the board and use it as a game controller or as a controller for a robot or um, something else. On the bottom left, you can see an example from an uh, application programming interface. So we also have uh, APIs for all of our uh, amplifiers. So you can write your own programs and your own applications and modify it in a way um, that it fits your application perfectly. Um, and if you're not that used to programming, you can see on the top right uh, an example from our research software. That's a kind of drag and drop uh, programming software where we integrated most of the algorithms that you need for, for EG processing. So you can um, pre-process data in there. You can do some feature extractions where you can, for instance, acquire band power signals. You can apply classifiers, calculate classifiers and create a feedback system. Um, with a display or sound output, or in this case, we in the on the screen there's 
there are two functional electrical stimulators. This is an example that we use for stroke rehabilitation, for instance. And we have a lot of applications in the medical environment. That's what you can see at the uh, bottom right, um, where you can see a, a stroke rehabilitation system uh, called Recoverix, where we use motor imagery to teach people to sense and move their limbs again. So um, since the talk is about bio uh, signals, um, I can give you a short overview about uh, the signals that we can record with these amplifiers. So our main focus is EEG. So we mainly um, build software for PCI applications. That's why we uh, acquire EEG. But with this technology, you can also record ECG. So you can detect heartbeats. Um, with these features, you can, for instance, calculate heart rate variability features or similar. We can record EOG, um, that's electrical signals emitted from the eye movement. We can record EMG data, that's when you want to measure muscle signals. Um, we have galvanic skin response uh, sensors for stress response measurements or similar. Um, SpO2 uh, sensor for pulse oximetry and similar sensors are used in the FNIRS, respiration sensors, accelerometers, and many more. So there are, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different fields of application, for instance, in neurophysiology, uh, physiolo physiology. Uh, we use it for epilepsy uh, in the cardiology. You can do some ECG Im imaging where we can um, use devices with up to over a thousand channels for a very high resolution. Neuropsychology for emotion studies, for instance. There are also applications where people want to use PCIs and biosignals in, in sports um, or for motion tracking with EMG, with high density grids, so you can uh, measure the muscle switches. The automotive industry uses it for um, assessing stress and cognitive load during um, driving a car, for instance, with neuromarketing applications. I already mentioned the stroke rehabilitation system, Recoverix. Um, some people use it in gaming, for instance. We already heard about the PE 300 or SSP P control before. Um, we have epilepsy and tumor patients where you, we use invasive technologies with ECOG, for instance. That's what we use in the system CORTIQ. Um, we use BCIs for assessment of coma patients. That's what we do in uh, MindBiggle, where we try to establish a simple communication with coma patients. And there are a lot of artists that are interested in EEG. You can see an example at the bottom right of Alex Guevara, who used the BCI to create some nice looking visualizations. So there are a lot of different possibilities, but the system that's most suitable for uh, AR, VR applications and the communication with, with this technology is the unicorn. Um, this is the consumer grade system, and that's the basic setup. Uh, what you're seeing here, we have an amplifier, an EEG cap, some electrodes, gel, and a computer. And that's basically everything you need to start a PCI experiment. That's what the amplifier looks like. And the Unicorn is an amplifier that uh, supports eight channels of EEG, you get this EEG data with a resolution of 24 bits and a sampling rate of 250 hertz. Internally, we um, use some oversampling methods to increase the resolution. We offer some hybrid electrodes. I'm going to show them shortly afterwards. So you can use this electrodes in dry or wet recordings. So for dry applications where you don't need any gel or in applications where you also add gel. So this is especially interesting if you want to use this AR, VR or similar applications 
um, for normal users, like everyday guys who don't know anything about BCIs, they normally are not very amused if you put gel into their hair. Um, the unicorn fit, uh, features some predefined electrode positions that we selected for different BCI paradigms. We already heard about P300 and SSVEP previously. That's where, why we have some electrodes on the visual cortex, um, because that's where we estimate the signal to appear. Uh, we have some, some electrodes on the, on the motor cortex, so you could also do some motor imagery experiments. Um, and the, the cap is also customizable, so you could also move some electrodes to the frontal cortex if you want to do some emotions or frequency bands. Etc. And we have a lot of hard and software tools so you can modify the, the system. So this is again the, the unicorn, how it looks like. You can see the hybrid electrodes pretty well. So um, if you use them in a dry application, you simply rub them through the hair. Um, and there's also a hole so you can fill some gel in and then you can use this with a um, in a wet or gelled application. We usually do that um, if we do not get a good signal quality with dry electrodes because of some disturbances or movements or um, different reasons. And here are some applications that have been done with the unicorn. So we had some makers. Um, in this case, they created a gin tonic robot that you could control with your alpha wave. When you were relaxed, you got some, some soft drink. And when you were stressed, you got a more heavy drink to calm down. <laughs> so it's a pretty fun application. I already mentioned the art application from Alex Guevara before. Some people controlled crazy uh, industrial robots, like in the top left. Uh, image and on the bottom right you can see some artists who created some 3d printed um eg headset where she integrated the unicorn and we schedule a lot of hackathons so if you ever are interested in trying the device out and the software interfaces or get your id going you can uh, visit brain owl and register for the next hackathon also this year there are a couple of which are hosted online, for instance, I think in April uh, during the next uh, GTEx Spring School. And here you can see a typical application um, of a combined EG and uh, VR um, system. Um, so the, the user is looking into the VR classes and gets some paradigm presented and at the same time, we are recording um, the EEG and he gets some feedback into his VR glasses. And we already heard before that the um, very basic uh, brain computer interface usually features a subject, which is wearing the brain computer interface. And usually you have a device that is um, doing all the signal processing, data acquisition, pre-processing, machine learning, and feature extraction, um, and also providing feedback. So the subject um, gets some feedback according to his brainwaves again. And this is the typical closed loop application. And now I'm going to roughly um, show you how you could integrate an, a VR and AR application in, in a very um, schematic and overview way because it, it really all, it depends on the specific use case, paradigm, etc., how um, the system would look in, in detail. So usually you have an amplifier and you want to acquire data in real time and for this um, you could use the, the APIs or some of the software um, that we provide. So we uh, have some, some data acquisition software and APIs that are real-time capable, so you can get your EG data in real-time. Then you usually apply some pre-processing. We already heard in the talks before that mostly 
um, filters I use, for instance, a 50 or 60 hertz notch filter and the bandpass filter. And then you can uh, go on with the feature extraction. So there are many different BCI features, but something that is very commonly used are band power features. And so you could do some band power estimation and directly feed this into the ARV system to provide some feedback, like in the application from the previous talk where they feed it in the, the alpha activity again to control some sound. And you could also do that with an AR or VR system where you um, could um, feedback your stress level or mental engagement level or something like that. Or you apply um, some, some classifier or artificial intelligence and um, output the classification result or the, the AI decision. Or you can also use the AI or VR system to present stimuli. Like for a lot of paradigms, we have uh, visual stimuli, like something that is blinking and you're reacting to, or something that is flickering that you're looking into. Um, that's also something uh, you could use the ARVR system to provide the stimulus. And I just want to give you a short overview about the software tools in the Unicorn Suite um, with which you could uh, realize the system. We have the Unicorn Recorder that is not very suitable for this application because it's just a recording uh, software where you can record files and then do some offline processing, but it's um, not possible to do some real-time applications. But with the Unicorn Speller, for instance, um, you could use the P300 component to spell, but also to control robots or something in your AR or VR environment in a game or something like that. Um, we had a lot of applications doing this in our last hackathons. And we have the Blondie Check, which is also a P300 neuromarketing application. We have some band power application where you can uh, calculate frequency bands and uh, create applications based on alpha, beta, delta, and theta uh, bands. Um, and if you're more programming affine and want to shape the application in your own way, you can use one of the multiple um, APIs available. We have, for instance, a C API or a .NET API. So you could use these to integrate the unicorn directly into Unity or Unreal Engine or whatever software you're using um, to control your AR or VR system. Um, we have a Python API. There are a lot of machine learning libraries available for Python, a lot of open source tools. And the Simulink interface. The Simulink interface could be used to control the system in combination with our um, drag and drop signal processing editor, for instance. And we also have uh, some open source interfaces that are available on our GitHub page. Some, for instance, a UDP interface. So you could easily use WebSockets to stream data to uh, your application or to your VR interface. Or we have an interface for lab streaming layer. Uh, we provide an Android interface in case you want to do something with AR on a, on a tablet, for instance. There's a Linux API, uh, API available. It's also compiling on the Raspberry Pi. Um, and we have a Unity interface. So most of the AR and VR tools are supported by Unity or Unreal Engine. So that's also something you could use. And we open source the Bluetooth protocol. So you can also create your, um, go to the very, very low level programming and shape everything in a way you uh, want to. And I mentioned before the Simulink interface. The Simulink interface would also um, be compatible with the Hyphus, where you can easily do the drag and drop signal processing without any programming skills. And then you could add a UDP or lab streaming layer outlet to stream data into your application from this editor. So we already heard in the previous talks a little bit about these principles, and I will go into some detail um, how you could use this principle 
in combination with the ARVR system at the unicorn, for instance, or another amplifier that we that we uh, provide. So the, the main uh, principles are frequency bands, like alpha, beta, delta, and theta waves, steady state visually evoked potentials, or short SSVP, or CVEP for code-based visually evoked potentials, multimetry and evoked potentials. And I'm going to start with the frequency band application. So um, for the unicorn, for instance, we have a band power application. You can um, see it here. You can see the eight channels of EG and some alpha waves for the last two or three seconds. And on the bottom, you can see the, um, the frequency band estimation. So for all channels, the alpha band had the most power in the last couple of seconds. And that's why uh, it selected alpha, which is usually appearing when you relax the wake or have closed eyes. In this case, the subject closed the eyes. Um, so that's one principle that you can use to control your software. There are different frequency bands that are um, assessed to different mental states. You have very slow delta waves if you're asleep. Um, theta waves often appear when you're in deep med meditation or very relaxed or like daydreaming or something like that. Alpha is usually present in an awake and relaxed state or when you close your eyes, um, as we did in this application. Um, beta usually appears when you're focused, when you're awake, when, when you have eyes open. And gamma is uh, a very specific activation and high frequency band that usually appears when you're highly focused or similar. And here I can show you a short video um, how this would look like. So you can see EG floating in there and then the subject is closing his eyes in a couple of seconds. So here you can see the, the slow alpha waves again with a bigger amplitude and a slower frequency range. And the signal uh, realizes that the alpha waves are the most present uh, waves immediately and puts it out on the console. That's what you can also use to, to control uh, an AR or VR system or a game. In this case, it's not um, used in a VR system, but here we have used this principle to control the speed of a Tetris game. But you could also um, use that in an, in an AR or VR class to um, represent your mental engagement level. In this case, whenever the subject got stressed, the speed of the, of the system increased. So the subject got even, even more stressed. And when the subject was able to relax, the speed decreased and you could easily perform the the Tetris game. That's just a, a small example on how you could use this paradigm to um, use the frequency bands in your uh, individual application. And here is an overview about the architecture, how it could look like. Um, for the unicorn, we have this unicorn band power program integrated in the, in the unicorn suite, and it features a UDP interface, so you could use the uh, signal processing directly from this software to control your system. But as mentioned before, it's also possible to use one of the APIs and do the signal processing on your own um, or use any other GTEC amplifier with ISIS or an API to, to integrate it into your game. And typical applications would, something, would be something like um, mental engagement in real time or stress relaxation monitoring or in games, you could use it to speed up, slow down systems or to force or teach people how to relax or something like that. And we already heard about this approach previously, so I will just sum it up quickly. So whenever um, you're looking at some blinking object, like in, in this case, um, you get a response, the visual evoked potential. You can see that on the top. And if you add some context to, to this flashing, like you're reacting mentally to the flash, then you're triggering the P300 response that looks 
slightly different. So we can use this uh, principle to create the P300 speller where all of the items are flashing all the time and the subject is only reacting when the P is flashing, and then it's triggering the uh, wave as displayed on the bottom. And for all the other cases, it's triggering the VEP or if the subject doesn't even look like it's just that baseline that you're seeing. And that's what we can teach the classifier, um, what it looks like if you're looking at some, some item or not. And if you're focusing on or reacting to that flash or not. And just to give you an idea how quickly this would work or how fast this system could be, so most of the people can learn this uh, controlling the P300 speller pretty fast and achieve a very high accuracy, um, like we can see here. Um, most of the people uh, got an accuracy over 90% um, within uh, four repetitions. So that's, that's one reason why we're using the the P300 pretty often because it's very stable and you can get very fast if you have a good signal quality. And here you can see some, some special trick that we um, use. We use this space uh, icons because um, your, your brain is, is um, taught to recognizing faces and um, that improved the accuracy a little bit and we reached a very high accuracy a little faster than with just um, colors, for instance. And here you can see some possibilities how to uh, integrate this in your XR application. With the unicorn, we have the unicorn speller. Um, you can integrate that more or less directly with a UDP interface. But you could also use an API and do the signal processing on your own uh, and integrate it into an AR VR system. Or you could use some of the uh, drag and drop processing that we provide in GHISIS. And then in comparison to the system previously, we need to feed back the trigger in, in this case. So for the frequency bands, we can just calculate it and for what, what we've calculated directly. But for the P300, this is. Um, the timing is pretty important. So we are only interesting in, interested in the EEG signal after something flashed and something happened. And that's what we, why we need a trigger. So I also have a short example how this would look like. So usually we start with a calibration run. So we check the EEG signals, if the signal quality is, is good. Then we uh, select some target items. Like in this case, we selected water, so five items, and let them flash for 30 times. And the, the subject is only focusing on the W uh, first, then on the A, then the T, E, R, and counting the number of flashes. That's the mental task he has to perform to provoke the P300, and he's ignoring all the other flashes in the background. And that's how uh, what we do to calibrate the system. When we calibrated the system, we can do some copy spelling to check if um, the signal was good and if we, our system is really able to recognize what, uh, what we taught uh, him to recognize. So in this case, the, the subject has the same task. He has to focus on the letter B then on the C and on, then on the I. And we can check if we can classify that correctly. And if we can recognize the items he's focusing on uh, perfectly. And then the system is al already putting uh, the, the classified item out and we can check uh, if we got a good accuracy. And if that works, then we can do some free spelling without any inputs and the user can uh, write without using any uh, inputs. So here's again a copy spelling. Um, here you can see we can also use dictionaries to speed up the writing a little bit. 
So in this case, we have an English dictionary with the most likely words that the user wanted to spell. And we could also use that in AR VR applications if we present something in the AR or VR environment. And that's what you can see here. So in this case, we had a mastermind application, the subject. Um, so this this uh, matrix in his VR glasses, and it was flashing the same way as we've seen with the speller before, and he had to solve some code that the system previously calculated. So this is in this case he got a got a wrong item, and that's one application you could use it in a in a vr application or in a game for instance and this is not a very exciting or uh, pleasing um, visualization but you could also uh, use it in some in some nice graphic games and let some structures um, flash like like the guys um, mentioned before from the from the other system And here you can see a very nice application that was uh, developed during one of the hackathons in Valencia. So this is an augmented reality application where they called it the, uh, the art of war. So one user was pointing the, a tablet on the floor and the pet tablet rendered some, some tanks into in, to the game. And the other user was a PCI user and he was controlling this robot to um, to uh, display his game strategy. So it was a kind of commander and conquer game um, where one user was the strategist and the other one um, told him what uh, to do and where, where all the tanks are placed at the moment. So I think that's a pretty cool idea. Um, they they used as a basic principle for this game, the P300 speller to control the robot. That's how he uh, showed the other user on his AR tablet, um, which moves he wanted to do and he, he would do. And the other one uh, just told him where are the tanks positioned. So I think that's a pretty nice um, idea on how to use the uh, unicorn with AR. Or during another hackathon, um, we also had an, a VR team that uh, was, was doing a surgery scenario. And one guy was the surgeon who had a VR class, and the other one was his, uh, his BCI assistant. And he selected the, the tools for, for the surgeon uh, using his brain. Um, and you can see the, the VR environment that the surgeon is using and the, the other uh, guy who's using the PCI is assisting him. That's also a pretty nice proof of concept on how you could use uh, a PCI and the P300 speller in, in a VR environment. Or here is also an, a nice um, augmented reality approach from a from a publication um, where they rendered some spots in, to recognize objects. And with the BCI, um, you could select the spots. So the spots were flashing. And uh, with the BCI, you could do something with the objects, for instance, show some information, text. And the next principle that you could use uh, in such a system would be an SSVP approach. So for the SSVP uh, compared to the EP, we're in a, another frequency range. So if for the uh, P300 approach, we had a splinking stimuli. Um, and when we reacted, we triggered something. For the SSVP, it's a, a little different if the spot is blinking fast. Um, then it triggers an SSVP, in this case, uh, 
to trigger an SSDP, the, the blinking has to be above six hertz. That's not required for the P300 approach, for instance. Um, and if this dot is blinking or the visual stimuli and you're reacting or just looking at the, at the stimulus, then you find exactly the same um, frequency in the uh, frequency spectrum. Like here you can see the seven hertz peak and you can see a peak at the multiples like seven, 14, 21 hertz and so on. So that's another uh, example. The nice pro, uh, thing about comparison to the P300 is that you just have to look at something and you don't have to count mentally or perform a mental task to trigger the BCI signal. And we can use different uh, frequencies, like these two dots are flashing at different frequencies. And that's how we can uh, create the multi-class system. So we could um, create some multiple objects flashing at different frequencies, and you can uh, select multiple classes with the EEG. And there's a very nice trick that improved the signal processing. Um, again, I've, I've just told you about the SSVP approach where we have this objects flickering at the constant frequency. And you can also um, do some code-based um, modulation where we're not having a constant frequency, where we have a time code. And we can check the EG signal if we can uh, find the time code again. And this improved the accuracy of the PCI system uh, a lot. And here are some possible um, XR integrations using the unicorn or another GTEC amplifier. Um, so we don't have a standalone application for this, uh, for this project yet, but you could use some APIs and program it on your own. I'm going to show you an, an example in a couple of minutes where a team managed to do this with a VR system and the unicorn. Or you could use the GHISIS um, and then send this to your AR VR system again. And again, for these applications, you need to feed back the trigger into your application or API because it's very important to synchronize the data with the flashing screen. So what this could, for instance, be used for games where you have flashing objects in your application and you detect with your software or with the, with the software at which item you're looking and control the game for instance. And also in the AR, um, we will also show you some examples in a minute um, where we use some augmented reality approach. Here you can, here you can see one example where we used it for a game in this uh, in this case world of warcraft but it could also be something that is uh, could can be presented in a in a vr class where you have some um, real um, xr application so in this case the user had four items which were flashing at different rates and he was able to move his avatar using uh, by just looking at the at the items we have a short demonstration and we have a short demonstration how this looked like so here's the Here you can also see that also this kind of system is pretty accurate. So the subject um, had a total error rate of 0%. So he achieved 100% accuracy for a four class system within uh, six seconds, uh, looking at one item. And with the CWEB approach, we can already speed that up a little bit.
All right. And here you can see um, what some hackathon group achieved during a hackathon in Essen within one day. So they created the whole signal processing uh, in Python. They had a VR class where they presented a flickering item, classified it using the unicorn, and then they turned on some light bulbs uh, when he was focusing on the flickering item. So that's also a pretty nice application of an uh, and the nice combination of VR, um, real world um, hardware and PCI signal processing. And they also control the robot, which was bringing them coffee because they worked all night pretty hard to finish this project. All right. And here you can see something that we uh, have currently been working on. So we have some AR glasses at GTEC, and you can see that we rendered some objects. Uh, into the into the screen and in this case the subject was looking at the different arrows which are all flashing at different frequencies and he was able to classify them um, pretty, pretty accurately and as in the video before you can see a very similar application here he has his augmented reality glasses on and rendered some some errors on the on the um, paper spots that he recognized in the software, and then he controlled the the light bulbs with by just looking at them. And here's also the, the same principle, um, just a little different application where he tried to control a labyrinth game by looking at the errors in his in his VR glasses. You can see that he wears a cap with the EG sensors and just put the, the glasses above. All right. And the last principle um, that, could, that you could use is the multi imagery, where you're just thinking about uh, movement and we try to recognize it with the PCI and then provide some feedback. Um, currently, we just had some hackathon projects where people try to control avatars with multi imagery. And at GTEC, we are using it for stroke recovery. And also, that could be done um, in some VR. Maybe it would be an even nicer feedback than in the, on the screen that we are currently using. And the architecture would be similar to the, to the other systems before. So that's how this, um, the stroke recovery system looks like. So usually, the the user sits in front of the screen and he sees some virtual hands and he's supposed to move them according to the instruction from the system. So in this case, he has to think about left hand motion. The stroke patient usually is not able to, to perform it. So we add a functional electrical stimulator that is stimulating with some current. And then the hand is moving. And at the same time, we're measuring some EG and checking if the user is also thinking about the motion. And it showed that this feedback loop um, makes it easier for stroke patients to um, recover and get some more sensitivity in their arm or often also movement. And for a gaming application, there's also a nice example that was developed during one of the hackathons where they had a zombie game and they just thought about motions, left or right hand motions, and they used the classification output to control a game. And that could also easily be done um, 
in an in a VR environment, so it does not have to be on the screen. So now a short summary for the future of, of BCI and XR. So I think there's rising awareness for BCI, AR, and VR, especially in the past few years. We are getting more and more requests for integrating BCIs and software um, for these systems. And we already heard in some previous talks that that, uh, that that gaming, the gaming industry is reaching out to get in touch with the industry, with the BCI and biosignal industry. So I think there, there's a lot of potential in this field, maybe also in rehabilitation systems, like we're using our BCI, BCIs also, or mainly. Um, but there are also, there are also some, some big problems. Um, I think that's the reason why we don't see these systems that much yet, because still it's BCIs are very relatively complex to handle and um, the devices, the software. So that there's a lot of knowledge that you still need to, to get some good EEG signal to, to calculate the classifiers correctly, to, to prepare the EEG signals. And so we're, for, I think for applications like in the gaming industry, it has to be something like a plug and play system. Um, we're getting closer and closer. So a couple of decades before it took, it took us uh, a very long, long time to prepare uh, an experiment and with the unicorn system, this, this process speeded up pretty much, but it still needs about five to 10 minutes to, to prepare everything and get the system uh, running and so on. And BCIs are um, compared to other systems or biosignals like iBlinks, EMG, and so on, and not very stable. So it's um, a little harder to, to control and to know what's going on at the moment. And most of the other biosignals to, uh, that you can use um, can be used way faster. Like you can twitch a muscle. Um, on the on point, but with the PCI, you often need repetitions and machine learning algorithms and a lot of software and hardware to get things running. So, yeah, I think I'm running out of time. So, um, I hope I could give you some insights into the possibilities of using BCI or biosignals in AR, VR um, environments. And if you're interested in getting in touch with this uh, technology, um, we provide some hackathon series where you can get hand on, hands on on some data or devices whenever we are able to meet in real world again. So. Thank you very much. And I'm open for questions if you have some. Thank you, Martin, for these amazing lectures. I think we have like a couple of questions. Oh, it's going development for Android application for Unicorn. Oh, um... Yeah, we, we, we do have an Android uh, interface. It's available on GitHub and it's open source. So you can um, also look at the code and modify it as you want. So this interface currently forwards you um, the raw EG directly. So um, yeah, you can shape the signal as you, um, as you want there um, and integrate it into, into Android applications. And we are we are also like looking on um, on Android applications if we might be able to port some of the stuff that we have right now, um, but that's something uh, that that still may needs time and will be something in the future maybe. Um, yeah. And then combining EG headset and VR headset, could you tell us how to deal with the EG signal that is usually troubled by head movements? Yeah, um, head movements and artifacts are a big um, issue if you're using BCIs. So um, you either have to check that if you're using it in a dry application that you have a 
really good pressure that you're applying with your VR headset um, or at, at some some gel. So, so in general, movement artifacts um, will disturb your EEG signal. But if you add some gel, it's kind of a buffer. And to some degree, you can tolerate it. In the unicorn also, for instance, you would have an accelerometer. So you could also like use this to check if the user is moving and you could give him some feedback, for instance, to not move. <laughs> um, we recently used the unicorn at the P300 software to play video games. It was very cool. Okay, thank you. Um, is there another question? Not right now. Regarding the, the previous question, I, I have also mine. So regarding uh, to, to put uh, VR devices with a unicorn platform, do you have to do you need to uh, make some adjustment or you just have to put your the VR headset on, on top of the cap? Um, yeah, like we usually just put the VR system over the cap. So we, we did not make any adjustments um, okay. hardware-wise so, so far. And you, usually that worked pretty well. So as long as the subject is not moving too much, like that's the, mm. that's the main reason. Yes. So that artifacts are, are a big issue still with PCI. There are a lot of nice cleaning algorithms, but if you clean too much, then there's also some signal lost and you will lose accuracy and speed again. So that's, it's always a trade-off. So still, we're not there to have a, a good EEG while you're wearing a nice looking headset with dry electrodes and you can run around. <laughs> so. But we're getting closer, <laughs> hopefully. Yes. Is there even small difference between left and right-handed for third person avatar tar control? And is there uh, replay. So for for the avatar control, this is usually mm, if you think about the examples, uh, talk about the examples I've showed previously. That's usually done with multimetry. Um, I don't know if there are uh, differences between left and right-handed persons, but usually it takes some time to to get used to motor multimetry and to get it running. So not everybody is, is able to do that. Um, right out of the box, like P300 is a very stable paradigm. So that's why we use it very often because you can teach it to people pretty quickly. But for multimetry, for instance, it really depends on the subject. So, so you have to train for a while. So a lot of subjects improve within some sessions. So for recovery, for instance, they, they get, I think something around 20 sessions and you can see the improvement that we, that we get more and more accuracy over time. And some people are really good at it immediately. Um, but me, for instance, I'm not really good at motion metry. Um, and I've done it a couple of times. So I think, I don't know if that's a left and right uh, handed predisposition, but I think there's a, a pretty big training influence. Okay, maybe there are other questions from the other panelists. Um, on top, there's wet electrodes, question mark, shout out. Yeah, wet, wet electrodes usually mean that you use it with gel. And if we're talking about dry electrodes, we usually use it without gel. And for the unicorn, for instance, we have a hybrid version that you can use with gel or without gel. Okay, so I think we are reaching right. the end. And thank you again, Martin. It was very interesting. And uh, all the, this talk uh, today was uh, very complimentary, I think, and uh, based on a lot of demos and, and animation and good explanation. So thank you again, uh, everyone, the BCI guys, Pierre, Harrison, um, Sylvain, um, and Martin, um, just to the last question from Eduardo, when will it become cheaper? 
<laughs> oh, that, that, that's not my responsibility. I cannot. <laughs> you have to contact Christos Sperfor. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think the com compared to the medical stuff, we try to make it way cheaper already because we don't need the certification and all the stuff, but still the, yeah, we, we're not, not mainstream at the moment. So we don't, do not have big quantities to make it very cheap, like a lot of other wearables. What is the price of a, un a unicorn actually? Uh, I think it's around uh, a thousand euros. Um, and yeah. it includes the, the Amplif, uh, basically everything to, to get started out of the box, to record data, some APIs and so on. And some of the software add-ons are, you can purchase additionally, but some of them are also included. So you have some open source tools on the GitHub. You have some of the applications that I've showed previously, like the frequency bands and recording and so on available for free. And the speller, for instance, requires an additional license. So you can modify it a little bit to, for the, the tools that you need and edit. OK. And just to, yeah, to, to wrap up uh, before to, to close the recording, so uh, just for, for the record, so that's uh, the first initiative uh, from Neurotechix to try to uh, give an overview of the crossroad between neurotechnology and immersive technology. So maybe later this year, we'll continue to organizing workshop on demo on, on other initiatives, maybe the more local or other global initiative. We will see uh, according to also your, uh, the, the will of the community, if I can say. And, um, and you are very welcome to contribute on, on this idea and to continue this discussion uh, on our Slack channel also. I can just put the link if you want. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's the end of this um, first event. So thank you again, everyone, uh, to attending to to, to, to be there and uh, I will try to put the, the replay shortly in a few days uh, for people who are not able to attend uh, today and yesterday. And uh, yeah, mm, that's it for on my side and uh, I let the floor to for further discussion as like uh, the, uh, we have this uh, habit in Rotatix now to host a neuro bar, so to, uh, to Hello, everyone, to, to continue on the discussion and uh, have a good uh, end of the day and, and see, you, see you another day. Thanks, Roman. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.